so uh, let's let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Uh, I'm Ray Grobel. I'm the rear commodore of Chicago Yacht Club. Uh, I apologize for the glare. It's going to get better. Uh, this is also going to be recorded. So if you miss any of the video, uh, you'll be able to see it. I want to extend special thanks to Matt Gallagher, who is chair of offshore sailing for U.S. Sailing, uh, and who is a member and very active member of the Storm Trisail Club. This is a joint presentation uh, with Chicago Yacht Club and the Storm Trisail Club. Uh, Rich Dumoulin, who Matt is going to uh, introduce a, a, a little more thoroughly, uh, is uh, past Commodore of the Storm Trisail Club and is uh, the president of the Storm Trisail Foundation. And Rich, I want to thank you and the foundation for your very generous uh, uh, donation to the Sea Scouts. We have uh, uh, about a dozen scouts from, C from the Chicago Yacht Club ship 5870 in the audience with three or four of the leaders. Uh, and this is where uh, the grant came from last year and there's another one coming this year. So, uh, it, it, you know, the foundation has been very, very helpful to us. Uh, Matt Gallagher, who is a longtime Chicago Yacht Club member uh, and very active in safety at sea, uh, was uh, really re responsible for lassoing Rich into this. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, and I'd like Matt to step up and say a few words. Thank you, Commodore. Thank you all for coming today. I'll be uh, as brief as I'm capable of. I see a lot of friendly faces in the audience who've heard me ramble on before. Um, so uh, again, um, I'm here wearing my Storm Trisail Club hat, um, and I want to thank the Chicago Yacht Club for partnering with uh, Storm Trisail Club in this presentation. Storm Trisail Club, for those of you who don't know, a number of the people in the audience are members, but is a... Uh, National Yacht Club um, dedicated to blue water sailing, to offshore sailboat racing um, and cruising. And one of, its, um, one of its strengths is safety at sea. The uh, safety at sea classes that a lot of you have taken through US sailing with one of my other organizations. Um, a lot of that was developed by, I'd say virtually all of that was developed by members of the Storm Trisail Club in one capacity or another. Um, Storm Trisail is truly the leader in safety at sea, um, both for adults and kids. And my uh, good friend, Rich DeMullen, who I want to introduce now, um, was really one of the, one of the guys who, who created the whole modern safety at sea movement. Um, Rich is a, uh, by profession, is involved in the shipping industry, is chairman and CEO of a shipping company with, with big boats, those ones that we try to avoid in our little boats. Um, but uh, more relevant to today, he is, he is truly a, uh, an offshore sailor. Rich has done, I think, four America's Cup campaigns, 25 Newport to Bermuda races. He's done Transpac races. He's done um, Sydney to Hobart, uh, Fastnet, you name it, except there is one glaring exception in Rich's resume, which is he has not done a Chicago Mac race. So we're going to, so anyone who's looking for crew, he's fairly competent. Give Rich a call. Um, <laughs> Rich also holds the, Rich is one of the leaders in double-handed sailing um, in the U.S. And he actually holds, this, this is mind-numbing to me, Rich. He holds the record along with um, Rich's, uh, my friend, Rich Wilson, um, of uh, 72 days double handing from Hong Kong to New York, if you can imagine that. Um, it's just, that's somewhat mind numbing to me. Um, Rich is past Commodore of the Storm Trisail Club. He's a member at New York and Larchmont, um, RORC, uh, probably other clubs that I can't think of. Royal Scandinavian, or you, you might be a member there, I'm not sure. But, um, and Rich is a, a great presenter, speaks on safety at sea around the country. Um, and we are really lucky to have him here today to talk to us about this. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Rich. For those of you on Zoom, I'm going to try to monitor the Q&A if you could put your questions in there. For those of you in the room, we're going to have a couple of breaks where um, if, if you want to speak, you can, um, you can pick up the mic and ask questions to Rich also. And I'll walk around the room with the mic for that. So with that, Rich, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matt. And thank you, Ray. Uh, great to be here in Chicago in this kind of hybrid Zoom with some people in the room and, and some on Zoom only. Uh, I hope it uh, works well. Uh, our approach at Storm Trisel to safety at sea is really quite different than others. Uh, we do present all the hardware aspects of it, the flares and all that kind of stuff, but we really focus on leadership and seamanship. 
which is fundamental to anything going right at sea. Uh, and uh, it's often ignored when you get into the details of all the hardware. So uh, the, the opening presentation really focuses on that. I'd love to uh, bring on some history because seamanship has been around for thousands of years and fundamentally it hasn't changed. Some of the hardware we use, the navigational gear we use is different, of course, but this decision-making and the fundamental seamanship and experience really is uh, pretty historic. And I love to draw lessons from history because uh, I think they stick with you, they're more interesting. And so uh, here we go. Is this coming through to everybody? Is it, yeah, it's, we... it's, good. it's good, Rich. Hard to see in the room, but it is on Zoom. So. Okay. Uh, basically, to, by using maritime history and applying it to modern offshore sailing, you can highlight leadership and seamanship, learn some lessons, and they stick with you. The picture on this opening slide is the endurance, which was just rediscovered a couple of weeks ago underneath the uh, Vital Sea uh, 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 Antarctic ice. It was Shackleton's vessel. And we'll get into that because the lessons that you learn from, from uh, an explorer leader like Shackleton really apply very well to uh, safety at sea, leadership at sea. Uh, before jumping into the deep blue, uh, let me get the slideshow going here. Uh, that's my power boat, which I've used for the past five years, uh, cruising the Great Lakes. And uh, uh, I love the Great Lakes, love fresh water, done a lot more motorboating than sailing, but hope to balance it out in the future. Uh, I don't know if you see the picture, but some sailing ships sailing off the edge of the world. Uh, a, a anonymous uh, author once said, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. We go offshore. And offshore could be the Chicago Mac race, could be the Premier race, it could be cruising. Uh, we go off there uh, to have fun, to have an adventure and experience. If you want to be 100% safe, you don't go anywhere. But we want to go offshore, want to do it as safely as possible. Uh, we don't want to do what uh, Plutarch told to Pompey back in the days of Rome, when Rome was starving. They had to send the uh, Roman ships over to Carthage on the, on the Africa coast to get wheat. Uh, he was told to sail is necessary, to live is not necessary. Uh, that's not what we're trying to teach here. The Great Lakes, uh, you guys know, and I know, need respect. Uh, it may not be as big as the ocean, but you've got the Edmund Fitzgerald Lake Superior, you've got wing nuts, you've got some uh, terrific squalls that can hit uh, on the lakes, as you know. You have the Amedi tragedy. Uh, the lakes have taken their, their toll and uh, or to be respected. So all the safety at sea we talk about here, even though we're not at sea, uh, being on the Great Lakes uh, is just as risky. So leadership and seamanship. The best definition for leadership uh, came from uh, Hyman Rickover, the father of the nuclear Navy. He was a no-nonsense leader. And he created the link between the leadership with accepting responsibility. You know, a lot of people like to be a leader, but if you don't accept responsibility, you are not a leader. And the way uh, he described it, uh, oops, let me get up there, sorry. Responsibility, it can only reside in here in a single individual. You may share it with others, but your portion is not diminished. You may delegate it, but it is still with you. You may disclaim it, but you cannot divest yourself of it. Unless you could point the finger at the man who is responsible when something goes wrong, then you never had anyone really responsible. Responsibility can be shared. Accountability cannot. Being accountable not only means being responsible for something, but ultimately being answerable for actions. So it's about accepting responsibility and accountability. It doesn't mean you do it all yourself. You bring in the, the watch captains, navigator, the crew, but ultimately the owner skipper is responsible and he cannot put make somebody else accountable. So when it comes to preparing your boat, your crew, dealing with emergencies, uh, if you're the owner of the boat, the owner skipper, uh, you cannot shirk your responsibility. It doesn't mean you're the best sailor on board. You don't have to be the best sailor on board, but you're the one responsible to make sure the right people are doing the right things at the right time. Uh, 
What is seamanship? Uh, the dictionary says it's the knowledge of and skill in the navigation operation maintenance of a ship. It's not uh, by chance that every great maritime power of world history before and now uses sailing ships to train their future leaders in teamwork and seamanship. I enjoy looking at the role of the captain. Uh, I'm in the shipping business. We have our captains out at sea. There's trouble on the ships. We all, you know, like all of you, we sail. The role of the captain is interesting. Historically, it's the old master and commander uh, with absolute power and total responsibility. And there was a good reason because before Marconi came along, when a ship left port, there were only two alternatives, either it arrived or disappeared. No one knew what happened if it didn't arrive somewhere. And the captain was totally responsible for that ship. And there have been some great captains in history, uh, Columbus, Magellan, Bly, you'll see why, Cook, Shackleton, all great seamen. And, uh, uh, and they had terrific responsibility. It'll be interesting later to look at, is it different now with today's communications? Uh, but I, I don't think any of you could name who Arthur Rostrin is. If you can, uh, yell it out so I can hear you. He wasn't the captain of the Titanic. He was the captain of the ship that saved all the survivors, the Carpathia. And why go back 100 years to the Titanic? Uh, it's an old story. Everybody's known it. We've seen the movie. But Titanic was the, the tragedy that shook the world more than any other maritime event in history. If you go down the street today and you just go to some passerby and say, name a ship, nine out of 10 times I'll name Titanic, even though it was 1912. Uh, it was traumatic but it was also the beginning of formal safety at sea. When the Titanic went down, uh, it was just a little time before World War I started, but during that time they held uh, the, uh, uh, the first uh, international safety conference, the SOLAS, Safety of Life at Sea. SOLAS began with the Titanic. Today, when you get your flares uh, and your life rafts, you want SOLAS approved equipment. Uh, and SOLAS has been modified through the years, but it is the formal, safety protocol of all ships in the world. And a lot of that has been used for what we do in sailing. Rostrum was a captain of Carpathia, a great leader, great seaman. In those days, uh, you got a trophy if you did something really cool like that from the unsinkable Molly Brown, who really did exist. Uh, it's an interesting story. And the aspect I'll focus on is the communications decision-making. Uh, the Marconi company, uh, provided the wireless operators for ships in those days. They weren't employees of the, company, the shipping companies. And Carpathia uh, had one radio operator. She was a second raider, as they call it. Uh, Titanic had two. She was a first raider. And uh, uh, the navigator of the, uh, the radio officer of the Carpathia was about to go to sleep. He's sitting on his bunk in his pajamas. And for hell of it, he puts his headphones on one last time and he hears the most famous SOS in history. And he knew the radio officers in the Titanic. He could tell their hand on the on the uh, on the radio telegraph, and uh, he immediately wrote down the position. And they basically said, "Come quickly, we're sinking." Oh, I'm old man, we're sinking fast. Position, and uh, the radio officer in the uh, Carpathia didn't ask him to repeat it. Say, "You got to be kidding! You're unsinkable!" Blah blah blah. Other ships ignored it. Uh, he ran up to the bridge and woke up the captain, who's in the captain's night room. And the captain didn't say, go back and check, this can't be true. He went to the chart table, plotted the Titanic's position, told the helmsman to turn in that direction, uh, got her up to max speed, 14 knots, called in all his officers. In the meeting with his officers, he basically had the all the heat, all the steam to all the rooms, because they were carrying passengers too, uh, shut off so all the steam could go into the turbines. They got the ship up to 17 knots, because Rostra knew that it was April, the water was freezing temperature, there's ice in the water, that the ship Titanic was going down, that he'd be dealing with hypothermia, he'd be dealing with people who needed immediate rescue. So he upped the speed. He had all the lights rigged on the sides of the ship to light up the, the water around the ship so they could find survivors. Had all the, the derricks uh, rigged out, had all the boats ready to go, um, had the cook take blankets into the galley to heat blankets and to prepare food. Uh, this guy had foresight. He had situational awareness. He was a decision maker. And basically saved 700 some odd survivors, about one third of the people who are on the Titanic. And uh, uh, it's a great story of leadership and seamanship, situational awareness. This is kind of a cool video uh, on YouTube of the Carpathia coming into New York Harbor. 
it was just a, a, a wild affair in New York. People are panicked, looking for their relatives and friends. And uh, uh, it was an amazingly traumatic event. And of course, we know now the only time you get in the headlines of the paper in sailing, uh, other than maybe in America's Cup, is traumatic events. So 100 years go by, almost to a day. Uh, and uh, anybody know what ship this is? I'm not sure I can hear you guys, but this is this is the uh, Costa uh, uh, Costa Concordia. Uh, the captain uh, uh, made some big mistakes. He came too close to shore at night in order to show off to friends of his on shore. He wasn't paying attention to navigation. Ripped the bottom out of the ship, and worst of all, abandoned ship with his passengers on board. And the Italian Coast Guard showed up on the scene. Uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, I don't know if you could see the subtitles, but basically the uh, Italian Coast Guard was telling him that he's got to get back on board his ship. He's going to pay for it. And he did because uh, he's still in jail. So the difference, voyage planning, uh, avoiding ice in the case of the Carpathia, uh, and then finding the Titanic, navigation, uh, Scatino running around, situational awareness, knowing what's going on around your ship, decision making, character, seamanship and leadership, basically accepting responsibility and accountability. It's a great contrast, 100 years apart. Some other examples of situation awareness that are interesting. A car carrier left uh, Southampton uh, docks, started to capsize almost immediately because she wasn't ballasted right. But the captain had the smarts to run her up onto the bramble bank, the mud bank right in the Solent, to prevent her from turning over with the crew aboard. A Korean ferry, uh, the owners put an extra deck on it. Uh, Dever got clearance to do that from the uh, class society. Uh, the ship took a sharp turn and started to capsize. The captain on the announcements told the passengers to stay in their cabin and everything would be okay, including 500 high school kids. Then he abandoned ship, the ship turned over and they all died. And he's in jail in Korea. And then we have the Navy with their collisions a few years ago. The Navy admitted that uh, the watch teams didn't have adequate situational awareness and the fundamental seamanship basically needed to be improved. The Faro was a U.S. roll-on, roll-off ship, a big, robust ship that traded in Alaska for many years from the West Coast to Alaska, rough water. Um, but in 2016, she's in the trade from Jacksonville, Florida to Puerto Rico. And uh, Hurricane Joaquin uh, was approaching the Bahama Banks and then stopped. And there's a gap you can see on the left side uh, between the uh, blue water of the Bahama Banks and the storm. And the uh, Alfaro captain uh, decided he wanted to take the straight course to Puerto Rico, didn't want to go through the Straits of Florida around Cuba. And uh, he thought he could get between there. The storm wasn't moving. But as soon as he got in between the storm and the banks, the storm moved towards him. And eventually the ship uh, capsized and sunk with all hands, 33 people. Um, there's the diagram. And there's the ship. Now, what did he do wrong? Uh, first, he was not taking input from his junior officers. He was not listening to uh, his chief mate and a very smart uh, first mate, a lady who graduated from, uh, I think, Maine Maritime. And uh, he wasn't taking any advice. And on some of their phone calls home using the, the satellite phones, they admitted to their family they were getting worried. But the captain wasn't listening. He wasn't using his team. He didn't have communication going both ways, up and down the chain of command. He was also using weather reports that he didn't know were nine or 10 hours old. It was a weather service being sent to the ship, but he did not know that they weren't current. And the storm had actually begun to move and he didn't know it for about seven or eight hours. Uh, this is an interesting one. We talked about Captain Bly. We all know that a couple of his people didn't like him, put him in a boat with uh, 18 of his crew who were loyal to him uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the South Pacific. And he sailed that uh, lifeboat, uh, became a lifeboat. He sailed it over 3,000 miles, only lost one person. That was the cannibals when they went ashore and uh, they, the one guy got caught. Uh, but he sailed this boat over 3,000 miles, the longest open boat journey 
uh, perhaps in recorded history, open boat, uh, no decks even, and to Batavia, which is now uh, Jakarta. And uh, Bly was a, uh, an incredible uh, mariner. He was also uh, the navigator for Captain Cook on several of his voyages. And he was one of Nelson's favorite captains at the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, so he got a bum rap in history, but he was an amazing leader and, and a seafarer. Uh, but juxtapose that to 2012 and Hurricane Sandy, the biggest hurricane in history, big in wind and big in diameter, uh, was heading for New York. And in New London, Connecticut, uh, right in the path of hurricane, was Bounty 2, the replica. And the owner wanted it in Florida for a schedule. And the captain was all obliging. And they, with his crew, he left New London, but determined to sail around the back of the biggest hurricane ever in the Atlantic. And went down, he went down, some of his crew with him, the Coast Guard almost went down trying to rescue the others. So talking about good seamanship and bad seamanship. And in the case of Bounty 2, you're in a safe port. One of your smartest decisions is stay there. If you're a racer, there are times where you don't go out and race, even if they run the race. You've got to make your independent decision. You're the leader, you're responsible, you're accountable. Uh, if you're in a race and you decide, I've got to turn around or stop for some reason, you're responsible. And uh, we all like to finish the race, we all like to win the race, but ultimately it's the leadership and responsibility that is, is uh, predominant. That's what you have to go with. And here was a case of needless loss of life and risk to others. The dramatic, uh, if in terms of leadership, the most dramatic that uh, I've ever come across is uh, Ernest Shackleton, the explorer in Antarctica. Uh, many of you have probably read the book Endurance or South or the heart of the Antarctic, the latter, latter two he wrote, the first one uh, his captain wrote. And uh, these are wonderful stories of adventure and survival. Uh, the advertisement that preceded the voyage uh, was Shackleton's advertisement in London. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, Bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Uh, I thought of using that to get crew from my boat, but I figured it might not work too well. Uh, anyway, he was a good judge of people. And he, he created, he had 27 other men and uh, uh, he handpicked them. And uh, he, he had criteria, which we'll get into in a moment. These are some great shots of endurance locked into the ice which was intentional. They were locked in so ice is a move south in the winter and the spring may be closer to the South Pole. Of course, they did. They underestimated the pressure of the ice and the ship eventually went under, only to be discovered about a month ago. They, after surviving on the ice and dragging their uh, boats to the edge of the continent, Elephant Island, six of them went off in this uh, open lifeboat with seal skin spread over the top. And they went 900 miles across the Drake Passage all right next to Cape Horn over to South George Island, then climbed over two mile mountains using nails from the hull, uh, poked through their boots as, uh, uh, as uh, 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 spikes to uh, climb the ice. And uh, it's an amazing story. But the, a, a professor from Harvard Business School, Nancy Cohen, uh, read through the diaries of the, of the men because she was doing a course on leadership. And much to her surprise, she found optimism in the diary. She would have thought that these guys trapped on the, in Antarctica, no communication with the world, no chance to live, would have been pessimistic, but they weren't. And these are some of the comments that came out of it. Uh, I can't read the top line on this because of uh, my PowerPoint here, but he could visualize things and then uh, anticipate any eventuality that was likely to occur. Shackleton made many contingency plans in great detail while still remaining flexible. He wasn't afraid to change his mind as the situation warranted. No matter what turns up, he's always ready to alter his plans and make fresh ones. And in the meantime, laugh, joke, and keep everyone's spirits up. He inspires optimism in everyone. She concluded by saying, acknowledge turbulence, embrace its opportunities, and meet its challenges with confidence and effect. And Napoleon said a leader is a dealer in hope. So these all come out of the Shackleton story. And over the years, an expression has been developed called Shackleton's way. What are the practical aspects of his leadership? Why did it succeed so well? Why did every man in the party survive? Why were they optimistic as they tried to survive? One was the preparation and planning selection of the team. That, that's primary in ocean sailing or ocean racing is that you prepare your boat, you train your crew, you plan the voyage, and you select the right team. You share a common goal. 
go win a race, have a great cruise, whatever it is. Mutual trust, respect, and honesty among everybody on board. Empathy, understanding your people. Communication up and down the chain of command. Uh, not like on El Faro. Uh, situational awareness. Think about Captain Rossman, for example. Adjust plans to change circumstances. You can't be rigid in your plans. If things change, you've got to adjust your plans. Accept responsibility for mistakes and move on. Res crisis response, calm, confidence, step by step. Instill optimism and resilience, never give up. So if you talk about your responsibilities as a leader on a boat, whether you're in a captain's role, a watch captain's role, or even the crew, the crew have aspects of leadership they need to practice. And uh, Shackleton is probably the best example of this. And it happens he's a mariner. It happens Bly was a mariner, Rostron was a mariner. All these guys are mariners. And through the thousands of years, mariners have proven to be very, very good at survival, learning lessons, and applying it. Uh, it's kind of cool that we, I had this slide in here because today is the 53rd anniversary of Robin Knox Johnson arriving in England, first person to sail nonstop around the world. For two thirds of those days, three and 13 days, he had no communications with anybody. Nobody knew where he was. And he's a, a great example. And he was very helpful in some of the stuff that I'll be showing later on in this, uh, in this uh, seminar. Uh, Conrad Coleman uh, broke his mast uh, a couple thousand miles from the finish line, the Vondi Globe. Uh, he ran out of food, he ran out of water, he jury rigged, and he still finished in France. And they had quite a welcome for him. You gotta look at some yachting disasters to, to kind of fill out the picture. Uh, the fast race with 15 fatalities plus four among boats that were following the race. Uh, that, uh, that, and then the, the, it was the biggest uh, response since Dunkirk in terms of the marine response in England. Uh, upper left, you, you might see a uh, body in the cockpit. Uh, you might see somebody else on the stern kind of holding on. Uh, Grimalkin got rolled by big waves in the fastnet race. The mast got ripped out. Uh, uh, one of the crew was killed down below and another one uh, dead in the cockpit. The other four people panicked, grabbed the life raft and abandoned a floating boat. Never abandon a floating boat unless I will tell you one, only one reason, but not due to flooding until you can literally step over to the raft. You don't want to. You'd rather be in a boat than in a raft. Uh, but they abandoned ship. And later, the, the British Coast Guard found Grimalkin. And the dead body they left behind the cockpit wasn't dead at all. He was unconscious. This crew panicked and left one of the crewmates behind. Crewmates probably better where he was left, but that's not what these guys intended. Uh, just panic, lack of leadership, lack of proper training, selecting the wrong crew. You can go down the list. Uh, Sydney Hobart, 1998, six fatalities. But when you look at the conditions in the, in the Bass Strait, uh, wind blowing 80 knots, 80 foot breaking waves with crests about a half mile apart, uh, rolling boats. The fact there were only six fatalities really illustrated how good the Australians are at heavy weather sailing and how well prepared the boats were. Uh, but both of these led to improvements in uh, safety at sea. Now here's a shot of the Bass Strait uh, in another race, a boat named Wild Thing. And uh, here it's blown about probably 40, 45, being an idea of, of the seas. Uh, number five jib, triple reef main. Uh, I would suggest she's over canvas and she didn't break up or break anything that this race, but she was darn lucky. Her name is Wild Thing, well named. She hits those ways, you watch the rigging sag. So, my observation is. Uh, <laughs> I think they're pushing the boat too hard and risking too much damage, but uh, this gives you a, a sobering example of uh, what it could be out there with wind against current and uh, that kind of condition. The response to the community to uh, Fasten and Hobart, safety sea training. Fasten race really spurred classroom safety at sea training. Uh, eventually, it went to hands-on training in 2006 when Storm Tricycle Club basically created today's modern hands-on uh, seminars. Uh, vessel design, in, in the facet race, uh, stability was an issue. A lot of boats got rolled. And so uh, some of the rules began to measure stability in one way or another, either actually measuring it by tilting the boat over at the dock or by 
uh, design. And, uh, but Sidney Hobart showed that waves hitting boats have a dynamic effect that could roll a boat. So dynamic stability is what became uh, more interesting. Required equipment, the PFDs, all the stuff we're used to nowadays came out of research and development later. Uh, we'll talk more about those later. Communications. Uh, race committees are much better today at keeping track of the boats. And part of this technology, the yellow brick reporting uh, uh, spot or whatever people use, but position reporting either whether by radio or by uh, electronic means. And then uh, the race committees often in some events uh, sending weather to the, to the competitors, uh, particularly weather warnings. And then the organization of race committees to respond to crisis. And every, every race committee that runs an ocean race has had to deal with this. Uh, Chicago, Newport, Bermuda, Transatlantic, Transpac, everybody's had to up their game on this. Uh, 2012 was a bad year in California. A couple of lessons to be learned from uh, some of the tragedy, tragedies out there. Uh, five out of eight crew lost in low speed chase. Uh, it's a race around the island that's out in the Pacific. You can see the tracks of all the boats. You can see a green track, a boat that cut inside uh, into basically four fathoms of water got around okay, uh, but they were lucky because there's a swell from the Pacific and the red line was low speed chase. She cut too close, a breaking wave, uh, rolled her and threw her up on the beach. And uh, the only three survivors were the ones who were on the boat. The other five who got washed overboard died in the rocks. And that's uh, that kind of gets it home when you see that the people didn't make it. Uh, the, the uh, challenge here was that no one was navigating. They were kind of assuming they could follow other boats. They weren't doing their own navigation. And they also weren't uh, keeping an awareness that if you're in uh, four fathoms of water and you got a five to 10 foot swell off the ocean, you're, that you're in breaking water and you don't want to be inside the breakers. And she was just too close. And uh, the owner had a very good local sailor uh, kind of skippering his boat. And I'm just guessing that the owner wasn't, you know, kind of ceded a bit of authority to the visiting pro. The pro was busy steering, who knows, but you know, something wasn't done right. The people on the rail all had one form or another of life-saving equipment, a dinghy vest, a fanny pack. One guy had a tether, but he wasn't clipped to the boat. If you don't have the right safety equipment and use it when you need to, uh, it's not gonna do you any good. Uh, two weeks later on the Newport Ensenada race, one boat quit, it was light wind. And so they, they, they plotted a course to Ensenada and at night uh, motoring, they went straight into the San Juan, the uh, San Juan Islands excuse me, the Channel Islands, and uh, broke up uh, on the rocks. Uh, the problem is vector charts. Most of us have chart plotters with vector charts, which mean it's a computer file and it's got uh, data in it. And when you're on the big scale, uh, you don't uh, see everything and you've got to zoom in. And all of a sudden, when you zoom in on a vector chart, something that didn't appear all of a sudden shows up like a buoy or like an island. These guys set the correct course to Ensenada, but they didn't zoom in and kind of fly their route and see if there were any obstructions in the way. Well, the Channel Islands were there and it, these guys didn't make it. That was the biggest piece the boat found. And the final story, uh, in the same year, uh, a uh, Columbia 32 uh, racing around San Clemente, fast uh, uh, sport boat, broke its rudder. It's a mile off the breakers. Uh, the crew thought that they could uh, sail without a rudder. Uh, uh, they, they called at one point uh, Tobo USA. They couldn't make it out through the, uh, the seas. Uh, they realized after a while they couldn't steer the boat, but it was too late. They were in the breakers and one of the crew died when the boat went on the rocks. So you know, you, if you're, if you have to have the situation where it's to know when you're in trouble, you also have to need to know your boat, know what it can do. You should know whether your boat can be steered with sails only. And if not with sail, if not with a rudder, what other technique? We'll get into that in damage control. All three incidents, situation awareness, navigation, improper use of safety equipment, and again, responsibility, leadership, and seamanship. So uh, we'll switch away from the bad news and get to the good news. Uh, faster race in 2011, uh, we're there on Carina, a 48 foot aluminum boat from uh, Connecticut. Uh, we just done the transatlantic race. Our teammate in the Fastnet, the other American boat on the American team was Rambler 100, she just raced across also. Rambler 100 is owned by George 
uh, 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 a guy named uh, George David, who was retired chairman of United Technologies, Sikorsky, Pratt Whitney, and all that. Uh, very well prepared guy. And uh, we're in the Fastnet race. Uh, you go out to the uh, lighthouse off of so South Ireland and turn and go back to England. Big race. There are almost 500 boats as last year. Uh, we had gales going across. And uh, we knew when we got around the tower, around the lighthouse, that we were winning our class. And we knew Rambler and that weather was going to go real fast. So we, at that point, the American team was winning. What we didn't know, there's the course down the channel, around Land's End over to Fasten It Back. Most interesting race in the world. Uh, but the start, the, you know, the open 60s have a class, the trimarans have a class. You race out the soul and you go around the needles, those rocks on the right. Those are the needles. Wind against current, five knots of current against wind. There's Fastnet Rock. Only the Irish could have built that with their uh, Guinness uh, probably helping them along. The two trimarans, 130 foot from France. Last year when we went around uh, on the Fastnet race, we were going out past Plymouth on the way out. These guys were on their way in having a tacking duel into the finish line. And this is what they, this was their spacing at the finish, having match race the entire time. They did the fasten race in 24 hours, 630 miles. That's us on Korean around the fasten rock. But before us was Rambler when it was blowing and they're rounding the rock in first. And a few minutes later, they're upside down. The, the, the bulb and the keel broke off and the boat capsized. Uh, other boats didn't see them because of the fog. And uh, 23 crew, 23 survived, but how did they do it? Uh, well, first of all, when the boat started to capsize, uh, they the, heard the snapping sound. One of the crew, one of the jib tailors, and you know, leadership and seeing the ship's got to be spread through the boat. Uh, he heard the snap, he felt the boat rolling over quickly. He knew immediately what had happened. And he grabbed the end of the jib sheet as he crawled around the boat as the boat rolled the other way. You might ask, why did he grab the end of the jib sheet? Well, he visualized uh, that they'd be upside down. He, was, he felt the boat would float. He felt the only way they're going to survive in 52 degree water was to get out on the boat. And uh, But you're not going to be able to climb up the side of a silky smooth racing boat upside down uh, with nothing to hold on to. So he took the rope, he pulled the jib sheet, and somebody else went around the other side of the boat, he threw it over the top. And the, the crew used that jib sheet to get onto the onto the bottom of the boat. Five crew, four crew were unable to do it. They drifted away in the current because the master ramble was sticking in the bottom. Uh, but they all had dry suits on because the boat was so wet to sail. They all had inflatable PFDs. Uh, there were four of them floating off, and Jerry Kirby from Newport figured they needed company, and he was a good gung ho guy, a real. Uh, upbeat guy. He swam over and drifted away with the five of them and got them in a circle in a position where they help keep, keep each other warm and also eye contact and uh, uh, optimism by seeing each other. This is what we learn in survival swimming. We'll do that in October. Uh, and uh, uh, they drifted away. Uh, there was an EPIRB on the boat, uh, the electronic beacon that would go to the satellite and the Coast Guard and would identify a boat in trouble. But the Rambler was upside down. It couldn't get the EPIRB. Uh, the two, few guys trapped in the boat managed to swim out and float up uh, with their shipmates. Uh, but George David, floating away, had a pocket EPIRB. And he lit it off. And about 10 minutes later, the U.S. Coast Guard called his office in Connecticut at United Technology said, is, is Mr. David there? And his secretary said, no, he's uh, sailboat racing. Where? He, England. So the U.S. Coast Guard called the British Coast Guard. They said, we have a distress signal from a boat named Rambler. And they thought, well, we better check the Royal Ocean Race. Well, we have the Fastener Race going on. They called the ROC. Uh, they said, oh, Rambler's fine. She just rounded Fastener Rock in first place. And the Coast Guard said, are you sure? So they checked their yellow brick and the, the transmitting had stopped. There was no Rambler on their yellow brick. They then called the Irish Coast Guard. The Irish Coast Guard left Baltimore, which is right near Fastnet, it's on the shore, Irish shore, headed out to look. And the news boat saw something going on and said, we'll follow. So the news boat followed the Irish Coast Guard. The Irish Coast Guard got out there, they're in that boat on the other side. And uh, meanwhile, the news boat came and the crew all pointed down current saying, five people are uh, disappeared in that direction. So the news boat went and found the five. And they were getting hypothermic 
uh, but they were alive. And one thing you'll notice that that crew that's in the top center with a black hat, how far above the water do you think his mouth is? Two inches? Look at his PFD, it's floating away from him. He did not have crotch straps. Now, when you guys uh, do the in the water stuff in the fall, you realize the value of crotch straps and you pull them tight, it boosts you another three, four, five inches above the water because it pulls the PFD down on your belly and along your chest, and then it, it props you up. Uh, these guys barely made it, but they made it because of all the safety stuff we just talked about. They all had training, not only safety at sea training, not only hands-on, but they did special survival training in a wave pool. Uh, situation awareness, we talked about. Equipment, we talked about. The PLB, the personal locator beacon, a baby EPIRB. The response by all the responders. The, the, the leadership shown by George in preparing the boat, Jerry Kirby in helping his shipmates, uh, and the fact that they had some luck. So the, what's the answer to seamanship and leadership and safety? Uh, first, available technology. You definitely want to use it. It's there. Uh, you don't want to have to count on it. You should know how to take bearings and, and do a, a paper fix on a chart, but GPS is nice to have. Uh, all the different aspects of radio, the VHF, the digital selective calling, which is complicated, but very useful. Uh, AIS to a location, but not only for the boat, but personal AIS beacons for the man overboard. The radar, if you have it, but EPIRBs and PLBs, the satellite communications, the chart plotter with the MOB function, safety sea training, but combine all that with leadership and seamanship. Without the latter two, it won't work. And this is what it's about. It's basically Rick Over's view of responsibility, Shadleton's way in terms of leadership. I'm going to end this uh, session uh, with two different photos here, uh, three photos. One is Ned Schumann, who uh, was a member of Storm Tricycle Club, a graduate of Naval Academy in John McCain's class. Uh, he and McCain spent five years in prison in, in Hanoi during the Vietnam War. And, uh, Ned, and uh, uh, Ned was an incredible sailor, and he ran Navy sailing when he got out of uh, uh, prison in Vietnam. And... Uh, he used to say uh, about sailing with midshipmen at the Naval Academy, I've often compared ocean racing with being a prisoner of war, an environment with which, um, unfortunately, I've had some experience. Hard conditions, cramped quarters, bad food, really bad in boats stocked by midshipmen, and diverse personalities. Instead of the guards beating you, Mother Nature takes over. You can't get out, so you make the best of it. It's a character builder. So it's a pretty good description of going offshore uh, on, on boats. Uh, this is my friend Gerard steering Karina in the transatlantic race in 2015. For over a week, it blew 35 knots from a stern. Uh, we had some great rides, and uh, uh, we had a bet with Comanche, the 100-foot carbon fiber fastest monohull in the world, who would get to England first, uh, who would get to the 180 south bearing on the Lizard, the entrance to the English Channel. And when we arrived there, uh, uh, two minutes ahead of them, uh, they popped up out of the uh, fog out of the fog and rain behind us. We're going 12 knots on an old aluminum boat. And here comes Commander. So anyway, that's uh we beat them by two minutes. Uh, I forgot to mention we started seven days ahead of them. So uh, anyway, that was uh, uh, our introduction to uh, safety at sea, basically focusing on uh, the people aspects and the leadership seamanship. So uh, Matt, happy to do some Q&A if anybody has any comments, disagreements, uh, their own stories. All right, I think we're good here in the room, Rich. Okay. 
So we're going to switch over to me now. Yep. All right. Um, I will point out in that 2015 fast or, uh, transatlantic race that Rich just showed the video of, one of our fellow Chicago Yacht Club members, Brian Earhart, won the race overall in his boat, Lucky, also Storm Tricycle Club member. Um, all right. We are going to switch topics here. I've got a lot of computers in front of me, so I'm hoping this is going to work. Uh-oh. We're going to take a two-minute break, so anyone needs to run to the restroom or anything while I'm fixing my computer here. We're starting right at 10 o'clock. It's 9.58, so we'll start in at 10 o'clock. Um, I have no idea, but I can certainly tr ask someone <laughs> to try. So, yeah. Nice job, Rich. All right, if we could get, uh, grab our seats, we're gonna try to keep going here. I'm gonna mute myself, there we go. We're gonna try to get going here. So I'm, hey Dave, how are you? Um, so I imagine a lot of you know this, but this, uh, this seminar is kind of the first part of a two-part series we're running. Um, in early October, we'll be doing the hands-on part um, of safety at sea training. So for those of you who need uh, international, offshore, uh, international offshore safety at sea training certificates, that's the old two-day one um, with hands-on training, uh, the club will be offering that in the fall. And I think Rich is gonna be coming in to, to help lead and moderate that. Um, there, it's a little more complex than just watching this or being here and doing that. You also have to do the online training through us sailing. We'll get word out to everyone on what you need to do for that. So, um, with that, I'm going to get rolling here. Um, my little topic is as always weather. Um, this, I'm not giving you a meteorology class in 20 minutes. This is weather their safety with a little focus on the great lakes here. If you watch the us sailing, um, 
videos. Uh, my friend Stan Honey does the weather portion of that. Stan's a great navigator and a great sailor and has done some lake sailing, but he's more focused on ocean hazards because that's where most of the people taking that class are. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, weather here in the Great Lakes, if I can advance my slides. Today is William Shakespeare's birthday, William Shakespeare and his death day. William Shakespeare is, uh, was one of the great early writers about weather. If you read, uh, if you read Shakespeare, and I love Shakespeare, um, weather is a dominant theme of a lot of Shakespeare plays, the Tempest being about an early hurricane that hit Bermuda. Um, so just want to little, say a little word about um, the bard here. All right, so what we're going to talk about in about 20, 25 minutes here is a little big picture stuff about weather uh, for sailing offshore. And then we're going to talk about hazards because this is a safety class, not a meteorology class. Um, and then I'll give you some more resources if you want to learn more about this. Um, any, anyone who pulls out their phone and says, I want to talk to you about the weather and start showing you app on their phone, ignore them because that's not, that it, apps don't tell you the weather. Um, if they're looking at a, the National Weather Service website, maybe I would listen to them. But fundamentally, you always have to start with thinking about the big picture. Um, if you immediately start looking at radar or at some website that tells you what the wave state is, you've already, you're kind of lost. You're not, you're not where you need to be. Anyone um, worth their salt, any offshore navigator, any meteorologist is going to tell you the first thing you look at are observations or analysis is another term for the same thing. Observation is what's actually happening in the real world. Not what a computer model is telling you, um, not whether what you're, you know, some, some guy on the internet's telling you, but rather what's actually happening out there. For those of you who sail around here, you should have the crib bookmarked on your, uh, on your phone. That's the first thing I look at anytime I'm gonna go sail because it tells you what the actual weather is, not the, not the hypothetical, not the hypothetical weather. When we're looking at the weather, we're looking at the big picture. We're starting with observations and then we're looking to a forecast. A model is not a forecast. So anyone who immediately leaps to models, again, you're making a mistake. There's a process, uh, my friend Chris Bedford calls it the forecast funnel. You start with the big picture and then you start moving down to what you're worried about before you go sailing. The big picture starts with observations, moves to forecasts, and then what you're doing with your boat on that given day. What we're worried about here are threats, right? This is a safety class. What threats do I face? We're not talking about weather routing here. We're not talking about trying to go fast. We're trying to think what are the hazards that my boat and my crew and my team face when I go offshore, whether you're the skipper of the boat. If you're the skipper of the boat, you should definitely be thinking about that. Boats that have navigators, this is their fundamental job. Their second job is to get you there fast. Their first job is to get you there. If you don't get there, you can't win the race or you can't finish your cruise, right? Um, so specifically, um, the good news about the big picture, about observations, about forecasts, is they're all free. Um, if you're paying for them, you're getting ripped off. Because in the United States, at any rate, I should say in the US, if you're paying for them, you're getting ripped off. Because all of the data behind all observations is provided well, it's not free, we're paying for it as US taxpayers, but the federal government provides all of the data used in any forecast you see. There are some private um, observation networks. Um, I think like Sailflow has some private buoys and stuff like that, but all of that data still feeds into the National Weather Service forecast. And you can get that for free through the National Weather Service. That's a great thing in Europe. If you were a taxpayer in France or Germany, you'd have to pay for that. Um, but here in the US, we actually do get all that information for free. Um, you can pay for services that provide this if you want to. It's fine if you like the presentation of observations and predict wind better than you like it on the National Weather Service website. That's fine. Go ahead and pay for it. I'm sure they'll be happy to take your money. But do understand you're not getting anything that everyone else doesn't have access to. It's all there. It's all there free. You just have to learn how to find it and how to use their tools. Um, so when we're going back to our, our weather map here, I think this is actually, yeah, this is yesterday, not today. So this is yesterday. So that's right before that warm front came through. You see the little red line there. Um, real basics here um, about fronts. Um, a front is where two masses of weather or air change, where there's a change. What's anyone know? What's the one thing that always happens as a front passes? Wind, yeah, wind change. Temperature may or may not change noticeably. Precipitation may or may not change. 
pressure does change, but you can't always notice it, but you can always notice a wind shift. Um, so real basics, cold fronts. Um, fronts are cold air moving. Cold air is denser than warm air. So warm air can never push cold air out of the way. Instead, we're talking about what's happening with the cold air. In the case of a cold front, it's cold air advancing into area that was occupied by warm air beforehand. When you think about a warm front, what's actually happening is the cold air is retreating and warm air fills in. But it's just basics because cold air is denser than warm air. Warm air can never push cold air out of the way. So as a cold, I mean, as again, pretty basic stuff, but it is something everyone on the boat should understand as a cold front approaches, you see a wind shift in the north, this is all northern hemisphere, in the northern hemisphere, generally a shift towards the west northwest, it's not always going to be out of the west northwest, but in that direction. Um, cold fronts tend to be associated in the Midwest with the most severe weather. That's not always the case, but most severe weather in our area is associated with cold fronts passing. A warm front is cold air retreating, because again, remember the warm air can't push the cold air out of the way. Um, usually you have a wind shift towards the Southwest, like from the East or the South towards the Southwest. Um, it's often drizzly, cloudy, rainy. Last night, I mean, we got a lot of rain, right? But we did have some lightning, but there weren't a lot of thunderstorms. That's um, pretty, pretty severe warm front passage, but that was a warm front passing through last night. So although it's normally stratus and clouds and a little bit of rain, you can get stuff like we got last night with, with a warm front passing. Stationary front is, like it says, stationary. It's just kind of hanging out. We don't see a lot of those in this area with the exception for Mac racers. There's almost always a, cold, a stationary front sitting right across the middle of the lake during the Mac. Back race. I don't know why. There's no meteorologic reason for that. It just is there um, always. Um, and uh, you can usually find it by where my boat is bobbing around um, in the middle of the lake if you're looking for that, if you don't have access to data. Um, generally light wind. A lot of times that's where we see fog. I'm not going to talk about fog, but fog in Chicago in the spring is very common. That has to do with the temperature difference between the water and the land. And then an occluded front, um, a lot of weather maps don't even show these. You're not going to see occluded fronts on the, um, on the nightly news, although they don't really show fronts very much in the nightly news anymore. But an occluded front is basically where a cold front caught up to a warm front. Um, that tends to be a lot of rain. What we saw last night would normally be more associated with an occluded front. It was actually, it was a warm front, but that's the kind of weather you get with that. All right, let's briefly talk about weather models because I have to talk about weather models. Everyone here has their favorite weather model, I'm sure. Um, but you have to understand what weather models are. They're not a forecast. Models, there's no such thing as a model forecast. Anyone who says, I got a model forecast that said it's gonna be blowing 14 out of the Southwest. Again, don't listen to them because they don't know what they're talking about. A forecast is what a human being creates using data, which can be observations. It can be models. Um, it can be experience. Um, but models aren't forecasts. Um, meteorologists will call them progs, which means, uh, I can't say the word, um, predictions, essentially. Um, so uh, prognostication, thank you, there's the word. Um, so weather forecasters are call them progs, but they don't ever call them forecasts because a human being does the forecasting. So what does that mean? Um, it means that it is an idealized representation of the atmosphere with an awful lot of assumptions. Assuming we know the state of the atmosphere at the beginning of this little computer model run, assuming the math behind the computer models is right, um, assuming that the grid that is used, because weather models can't forecast like here and here and here, instead they forecast on a grid that's a huge spatial scale. The smallest weather models you'll ever see forecast on about a one kilometer grid. So they're saying um, what's happening here and what's happening one kilometer away and it has no opinion on what's happening in between. Now one kilometer is about the scale we probably care about in most sailboats. Very rare do you see a one kilometer model. Most of the models we see have a 20 kilometer grid or possibly a 12 kilometer grid. So there's like two grid points between here and Michigan. So as I'm sailing my boat from here to Michigan, I care an awful lot more about what's happening on the scale of my boat, right? So that, that's something else you have to understand is that the scale of weather models is, is a lot coarser than most of us care about for most of the types of boats that we sail. Um, and so they're not designed for us. That's why you need a forecaster to actually, um, to actually interpret that for you on the scales we care about. 
And you can be that forecaster. I'm not saying you need to hire someone, but do understand that if all you're doing is looking at a weather model and you have your favorite weather model, you're not forecasting anything. Um, again, I think this is a Chris Bedford line. All models are wrong. Um, there's no such thing as the right model. Some are just less wrong than others on a given day at a given time in a given place. All right, so again, basics, but we do have to talk about it. How is wind represented on a map? Um, you know, on the right, again, I think that was, yeah, that was early this morning when I updated this. That's showing, that's one way of showing the wind. The most common way wet, uh, meteorologists look at the wind is using those little arrows, as coarse as that is. And if you see those, you probably see those in a lot of like, actually, if you're, you have a B&G chart plotter or I think a Garmin, they show the wind that way also. Under, you have to understand what that means. Those little barbs in the back, you probably think, oh, I know what that means. If there's no, no barb, then it's like five knots or under five knots. If there's one barb, it's five knots. If it's a big barb and a small barb, we add them together, it's 15 knots. Um, the problem with that is it's pretty coarse. And again, I, I don't know what kind of boats you all sail or motor around in, but the difference between 10 knots and 15 knots is pretty big on my boat. I mean, that's a big difference between 15 and 20 knots is very big. And the little arrows that we look at are pretty coarse. In other words, they're not going to tell you whether the one's blowing 12 versus 17. All of those are going to show up as 15 knots. And again, big difference between 12 and 17. So understand what you're seeing. There are much better ways of visualizing wind that we're not going to go into today, but um, for, uh, for use in sailing. This is in here. This is all live link. But if you ever look at a National Weather Service chart of observations, this is how they display weather data in a very condensed format. And again, this is, you can download this presentation if you want to learn it, but it actually is pretty useful. It shows you wind direction, pressure, temperature, um, dew point, which helps you figure out how humid the air is and how cloudy it is, or if there's fog, it tells you what the sky cover is. It's a pretty condensed way of, of looking at information. Um, again, these are these links are all live in the version of this you can download, but this is where I go to start my weather forecast every day as I look at US government weather sites. There's no reason to look at anything else. Um, the local National Weather Service forecast offices are fantastic. If you're a Mac racer, you should be checking Chicago, but you should also be checking Grand Rapids and Gaylord up the Michigan coast. You should be looking at Milwaukee and Green Bay if you make the horrible mistake of going up the Wisconsin shore. Um, but all those local forecast offices know their areas. They have teams of meteorologists that work 24 hours a day that know local weather better than you ever will unless you live in that area. Um, one thing to know is marine forecasts. So like the open waters of Lake Michigan, if you hear them talk about that, are issued by people who can't see the water, um, which is an important point. They're, these guys are located in Milwaukee. Um, they used to be in Chicago, now they moved it to Milwaukee. They're great people, but do understand that they're, they can't see anything that they're forecasting for. Whereas when they're forecasting for Milwaukee, they can literally, and they will literally just look out the window as a little reality check. So understand that, um, they can't see what they're forecasting. They don't have any, like there's no cameras out there to tell them whether they're right or wrong. And they're not forecasting for us is the other thing to remember. They're forecasting um, to protect life and safety on average. So what they're really thinking about is big ships out there, the badger going across and the impact the marine um, weather is gonna have on shore. So do understand, like they really don't understand anything about little sailboats. And we try to educate them. We, we go up a couple of times a year and talk to them. And they're fascinated that anyone would want to go bob around in a 35 foot boat in the middle of the lake in a storm and enjoy it. But so um, understand they're doing their best that they can. Radar. So one of the things that many of us are lucky enough now to have that no one had access to 10, 15 years ago is radar on your boat. So I'm talking about weather radar. You may have it on your phone um, if you have uh, uh, Sirius XM weather. I think there's a competitor to that too. But if it shows up in your chart, plot or something like that. It's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's amazing that we have that, but you have to understand what you're seeing. A couple of important things. The most important thing to know is what you're seeing is not live at all, not even close to live radar data. At a minimum, it, think of it as 10 minutes old, up to half an hour. Um, if you have, uh, I have a BNG chart plotter with Sirius XM, I'm assuming that what I'm seeing is about a half hour old. Because the way radar works is it's not like there's a magic little beacon out there that can instantly sense the whole atmosphere. It actually looks kind of like those old World War II radar things that you see in movies. Inside that white dome is a spinning thing. And this little spinning antenna sweeps around and it scans. And the diagram at the top tries to illustrate it. It doesn't scan the whole atmosphere. Instead, it scans slices of the atmosphere. 
It goes around, scans, then goes up two and a half degrees, scans again, up two and a half degrees, scans again, up and so on, until they cover up to about 20 degrees above the horizon. Then computers take all that data, compile it, send it out over the internet, and then you see it live, if you're looking at, I mean, live, ten, two to 10 minutes late on the weather service website. If you're looking at an app or if you're looking at your chart plotter, there's a whole nother series of computers between you and it that have to transmit the data. Like if you're using SiriusXM, it's gotta go up to their uh, satellites, down, your boat has to process it. So you are not seeing anything live. So if you're super smart and you see this front coming, you think, oh, I've got like, I got five minutes, so I'm gonna keep my sails up a little bit longer you're making a huge mistake because um, that weather could be on you much more quickly than you think. The weather service actually has two different, mo and all radar data is from the weather service. There is no private um, radar data that you would ever want to look at. The exception is the FAA and some airports has it, but that feeds into the weather service. Um, the, uh, the weather service uh, has two different, what they call scanning modes. One of them when they're not expecting bad weather. And in that case, it's about 10 minutes between updates. So when you see the weather kind of jump on your app or on, on your chart plot or weather, that's because there's a new update. It's about 10 minutes, again, when they're not expecting bad weather. When they're expecting bad weather, the jumps are about every four minutes. They basically scan more quickly. Um, the other thing to think about is, um, and again, most of us know this better than others because we are out in boats, but um, radar is radio waves, right? That's what the R is, radio. It can't go through the earth. And we all know that on, on a little boat, the horizon's maybe about seven miles away, eight miles away, something like that at, uh, at sea level. So this radar dome is sitting out, the one here is sitting out in Joliet. So it, when it's scanning straight for it as the earth curves away, it's scanning up. So it actually can't see what's happening down here, like right, like at the height we're at right now, because of the curvature of the earth, that radar beam is going over us. And the further away you get from the radar, the bigger the gap between the bottom scan and the earth is as the earth curves away from it. And so things happen in the atmosphere. Uh, I think with the spacing of the weather, weather radars, they tend to be about 150 miles apart between the National Weather Service wants to cover most of the earth. Things happen in that lower part of the atmosphere that they just can't see. So if you're looking at your, you know, you're looking at your phone or your app and it says there's no clouds above you, but you see clouds or precipitation above you, it may just be because of, of basic physics and, and geometry that they can't scan through the earth to see it. So again, radar is an amazing tool, but do understand it's got some severe limitations. Um, all right, hazards, we're gonna talk about hazards for about 10 minutes. Um, as part of your, um, going back to what Rich was talking about in terms of leadership and preparation, this falls squarely in the preparation category. Before you set out on any voyage, you should be thinking about this. And that could be a voyage, you know, out for a cocktail to the cribs, or it could be a race to Mackinac, it could be a transatlantic race, it doesn't really matter. You need to think about what's the likelihood of something going wrong weather-wise. You should be thinking about that with everything. What's the likelihood of something going wrong with my boat? What's the likelihood of something going wrong with my passengers or crew. But in terms of weather, think about that. Um, you know, is it a day like today where it's bright and sunny and there's no rain and there's nothing forecast right now? Although if you looked at the forecast, you'll see that later this afternoon, the wind's supposed to be building. So you need to think about that likelihood. And then you need to think about the type of weather hazards my boat's going to face. And this should all be done before you set out. Or if you're racing, this should be done every watch change or every 12 hours or something like that. There should be a process for thinking through the hazards. Um, the hazards to boats in terms of weather are fundamentally winds, waves, and storms. We're going to talk about storms. Lightning too, but that's part of it. So wind. Again, understanding what the weather service is talking about is really important. Some of you may know this already, but wind is always forecast at 10 meters above the ground. So that's 30, 33 feet above the ground. Um, some of our masts are about that high. Some are much higher. Some of us don't have masts. Um, and the height above the ground um, does affect both the direction of the wind and the speed of the wind. The friction of the earth, the friction of buildings, of the waves, of the water, um, slow down the wind a little bit as you get lower and actually will turn the direction generally a little bit to the left in the Northern hemisphere. Um, so when you're sitting there, you know, on the 10 feet above the water and the flybridge of your powerboat, 
and and the weather and the forecast said that the wind's going to be blowing 15 and you're only seeing 12 it's not wrong it's because you're not where they're forecasting the wind for 10 meters above those of us with sailboats with masts sometimes have the opposite problem sometimes our wind instruments are higher than 10 meters and again, you get a little bit of a directional difference and speed difference as a result of that. When they're talking about wind speed, they're talking about wind speed averages over two minutes, not the instantaneous reading, but an average over two minutes. If you have wind instruments on your boat, you can actually set them to smooth that, to average it to two minutes if you want to. I do. When they're talking about wind gusts, um, wind gusts are only forecast if they're 10 knots or more above the base wind, of the two-minute wind. So if you think about that, a nine knot gust in some boats is real, right? And they're not gonna warn you of that. So don't assume that because they don't forecast or report gusts, that it's not what we would think of as gusty. The difference between 10 and 19 knots in my boat, again, is real um, and, and would affect my behavior, but it's not gonna be forecast. Peak wind, which gets reported, sometimes the crib reports this, um, is only if it's greater than 25 knots. So you don't always see pre peak wind forecast. The Beaufort scale actually, Rich re referenced this in his FastNet reference where he said it was a force 12. Um, the, the Beaufort scale is like old school, but it's actually kind of worth getting to learn because it's wind as experienced on the water. Um, and you can actually kind of tell the wind speed just by looking at the surface of the water. I expect you all to memorize this. I'm going to quiz you on it in like two minutes. No, but the, this is there for you. You can find this on the internet somewhere. Someone told me that Force 12 is where uh, either penguins or ostriches are flying. Then you know it's a Force 12, a Force 12 wind. Um, waves. Um, the Farallons incident uh, made us all refocus on waves, not strictly weather, but waves are generally caused by weather. Um, the significant wave height, which is what's forecast, that's what you hear on your VHF, um, is the average of the one third of all, average, so basically you take your waves, you do them in thirds, so two feet, four feet, six feet, whatever it is, the average of the third that's the, at the extreme end. So what that means is you're going to see waves significantly higher than the wave height forecast. So if they say four to six foot waves, you should expect to see a nine to 12 foot wave once every, I think it's every six minutes or something like that mathematically. So don't, if you see a forecast for four to six, don't say, oh, the worst I'm gonna see is six. That's just not the case. You're actually gonna see ones up to twice that, um, just not very often, hopefully. Um, on the right, I'm not gonna go too much into this because we don't deal with it here too much in the Great Lakes, but one of the things that did come out of the Farallons incident is a better mathematical understanding of when you should expect breaking waves over underwater um, shore, rocks, things like that. At the Farallons where that accident occurred, the uh, rocks were all underwater um, and they steered well clear of those, but because of the rise in the seafloor and the prevailing swell in the ocean, there were breakers where people didn't really expect to see breakers. Um, waves are the things that damage boats. Um, it's not wind, but it's waves. Waves are what sink boats. Um, in terms of weather hazards. Um, this chart, again, is probably a little bit hard to memorize, but it does tell you basically the way they forecast waves on the Great Lakes is they look at the direction the wind's blowing from and how much and the wind speed and how much fetch it has, the distance it has, the wind has to work over the surface of the water. Um, again, those of you who sail around here know that if the wind's out of the west or southwest, you're not gonna have much of a sea state, right? And the reason that's the case here in Chicago is because the wind doesn't have much time to work over the surface of the water to create those waves. That same wind out of the west here is generally really unpleasant if you're over in Holland or St. Joe or somewhere on that shore, because then it's got 20 or 30 miles of lake to blow across and build up energy. Again, that's why here the worst winds are north winds, right? That's where we see our big waves because it's got all 300 miles of Lake Michigan to blow over. This chart will actually tell you how they forecast that. Um, best surf, best thing we have in the Great Lakes is Gloral. If you're not familiar with that, you should be. Uh, Gloral is a Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. It's run on the University of Michigan in cooperation with the Weather Service. They forecast um, wind and sea state. Um, and a lot of other things, ice, if you're an ice, ice boater, um, wind and sea state in the Great Lakes. Um, and it's absolutely the most accurate forecast available um, for those things in the Great Lakes. All right, briefly on thunderstorms, I'm running out of time. Um, 
learn the different types of thunderstorms because the hazards presented by them are different. There are three basic types of thunderstorms and then two other things we're gonna to touch on briefly. Single cell storms are the least threatening. Um, it doesn't mean they're not threatening, but if you see a sky that looks like that picture on the left or a radar image, like you see that in the right with just little storms popping up here or there, generally the risk is minimal. Those storms tend to last only 30 to 60 minutes. Um, the risk from those is gonna be uh, wind more than anything else. Um, and usually they're not too much to worry about. Um, Multi-cell storms become more troubling. Um, that's where you see a whole bunch of those, not just one up, but again, look at the rate, the difference in the image between there where you see a couple little things popping up and there where you see all sorts of them and they tend to organize themselves into lines. Um, those are often, those often occur in the springtime in this area. Um, and they um, tend to be a little more threatening, but again, not the type of thing that you're probably going to delay a voyage over. Um, Supercells you are absolutely going to avoid with a passion. Um, and if you see those, you just don't, you don't sail if you can avoid it. Um, supercell thunderstorms um, are the types of storms that throw off tornadoes. About 30% of supercell thunderstorms will throw off a tornado. 100% of supercell thunderstorms will throw off hail. If you've ever been hailed on in a boat, it's not much fun. Um, and they tend to have extremely strong damaging winds. Um, the, if you hear some weather forecaster on the weather, on the weather radio talking about supercell thunderstorms, the hair on the back of your neck should go up um, and you should be very, very alert. Um, tornadoes are set in this area essentially always associated with supercell thunderstorms. In the tropics, they can be associated with hurricanes too, but not here. Squall winds are the ones that are actually probably the greatest threat to us as boaters. Um, anyone who's sailed through that knows just how much fun that is. Um, squall winds um, are a very common thing here in the Great Lakes. They don't get them as much on the East Coast or West Coast. Um, they require a lot of land to build up the heat that creates this. And so that's why we're perfectly suited for that here. Um, they're organized linear um, patterns of storms. Um, the danger from these is straight line winds. You can have winds that are well in excess of hurricane force um, at the leading edge or out front of the leading edge of those storms. And there's no way to avoid that. I don't care how fast your power boat is, you're not driving around that thing. Um, you know, maybe if you're in a, in a, in a like Lisa's boat or someone else's uh, that can move a little faster than my sailboat, you might be able to drive around to avoid some of the smaller types of storms. There's no avoiding that. The danger is um, wind and the real danger is out front of this line. I'm gonna show you an image in a second or two. If again, you're looking at your radar app or you're looking at your chart plotter and you see that red line come and think, oh, I got five miles. So first of all, remember that's 10 to 30 minutes out of date by the time you see it. And secondly, the danger extends in front of that line. Actually, you can kind of see it a little bit um, right above where the word squall line is. This is a slightly older image. You see that little blue out ahead of the red? That's called a gust front. I have another image in a second that shows that better. Um, a lot of times the most damaging wind is ahead of the red on the radar. You know, so when the red gets there, the wind may very well have settled down. This is actually an image of that. This is taken by a friend of mine who lived down in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale at the time. Um, that's a view from his condo of that approaching storm. And you can see where he is. He's in the little blue circle right there. But just to the right of that blue circle with the little hash marks, you can see a little line kind of bending out and up to the up to the right there. That's the leading edge of that storm. That was hitting already in the picture that you can see there. And look at the palm trees bending in that wind. I think he, he didn't have a weather instrument, but he was guessing it was probably 50 or 60 knot winds. Well ahead of, again, if you look in the photo, um, that line of clouds right above the sky, that's the storm. That's like the orange and yellow and red on the, on the weather radar. Um, the damage is already done well before that gets there. So, so that's always something to remember, particularly with, um, with squall lines, is, is that you got to be ready well before that thing gets to you. Um, and I am now going to wrap it up. This is, there's a little more content in here. You can download it and look at it at your convenience, but I want to stay on schedule here. So, Rich, if you are ready, do you want to take over? Yeah, I thought since people had a little break before, uh, I should probably start my damage control presentation. But then near the end of it, when I go to the videos of some uh, real cases, 
maybe take the break and then come back for the videos. Uh, so if everybody can handle another PowerPoint, uh, stand by for damage control, get ready for a little carnage here. Uh, it's a very interesting topic that, uh, you know, when something goes wrong, how do you deal with it? But how do you prepare to prevent uh, the need to deal with it? Uh, hang on while I bring this up. Okay, is damage control showing? Yeah. Okay, uh, I like titling this, don't give up the ship. And somebody pointed out, well, at some point you might have to get in a raft yeah. and an abandoned ship. So we've kind of modified to say, don't give up the ship until you have to. Uh, and uh, uh, we see out there in a lot of events, people abandoning their ship, asking for rescue when they don't need it uh, because they're panicked. Uh, they don't think they can cope with the situation. And uh, it, it, that's the wrong approach to going offshore. You should go off prepared, ready for virtually any emergency you can manage. Uh, sure, if you get in trouble, uh, you know, call a pan pan or even a mayday, but you've still got to cope with your own problem. And even with today's modern communications, you're probably on your own for a while. You're going to have to deal with it. So the attitude is uh, uh, to, to basically say, I'm going to deal with it and uh, we're going to get through it. Uh, we may have to change our goals like Shackleton and instead of finish the race, find a port of refuge uh, or survive long enough for rescue to arrive but you really got to be prepared uh, to deal with incidents. Uh, I love to reach out to history. This is where Don't Give Up the Ship comes from. Admiral uh, Captain James Lawrence uh, blockaded in Boston during the War of 1812 on his frigate Chesapeake. Been there for almost a year, very little time for his crew to practice gunnery or sailing, but Captain Lawrence couldn't turn down a dare. And uh, the Shannon and the Captain of Shannon uh, in the blockading British force challenged him to a one-on-one -on -one duel, and the rest of the British fleet would withdraw and let the two ships duke it out. Captain Lawrence made some fundamental mistakes. Number one, he went out with an unprepared crew, a ship that hadn't gone through training, gunnery, sailing. He went out uh, to fight a very prepared Shannon. So, you know, you're a sailor, you go, to, you go out to see if you're not really ready, your crew's not ready for it. You've got to prepare. And then uh, they got out there, and uh, before he knew it, the, the British had shot his steering. And you can see in that picture, uh, the, the Chesapeake sailing backwards in irons, uh, unable to steer, unable to rotate and uh, aim their guns. And the Shannon basically crossed the stern, raking him and uh, basically yeah, mortally wounded uh, Lawrence, whose last words don't give up the ship, but 10 minutes later, they gave up the ship. So. It's not the story, it's a story of bravery, but it's not the story of leadership, clear thinking, preparation that one would like. Shackleton, of course, is the better uh, uh, story about being prepared for contingencies and keeping people's spirits up and dealing with it. Uh, Knox Johnson, uh, 313 days to see, dealing with all the problems himself. At one point, uh, you know, almost ready to give up. And, uh, he, uh, he's lying on his side, the steering gear shot, the boat just lying on its side, uh, uh, knocked down, uh, not sinking, but basically he was ready to give up. And then he picked up, this is from his book uh, that he wrote after the race around the world. Uh, for some irrational reason, I also thought of poetry and the words of Robert Service's ballad, The Quitter came to mind. When you're lost in the wild, you're scared as a child, and death looks you bang in the eye. And your sore is a boil, it's according to Hoyle, to cock your revolver and die. But the coat of a man says, fight all you can, and self-dissolution is barred. And hunger and woe, it's easy to blow, but sell, serve for breakfast, that's hard. And he describes how that saved him. And he went out, he got the boat upright, he fixed it, and uh, finished sailing around the world. So he, even the strongest people can get psyched out. But the fact is, the team should pull together and deal with what the problem is. So it still comes back to leadership and responsibility, accountability, but the preparation, it's a team, it's a crisis response, the optimism, that's what helps you do a damage control. To jump into damage control and just talk about what you do with the rubber plug or the wooden plug or, or, uh, your, or your angle grinder is wrong. You've got to talk about why 
how you prepare for damage control and how you deal with it. And it really has to do with training. The Marines say it best. You train the way you fight, you fight the way you train. So in preparing for damage control, you want to make sure that you and your crew know all the tools, know what to use for it, know you have the right stuff aboard, know what you need to deal with each situation. It requires often stop thinking and acting, kind of like first aid. You don't want to do the wrong thing and make it worse. But the more prepared you are, the quicker that stop, think, act process takes less time. And then uh, one of our in you know, one of our leadership seminars, we had a, 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 a nuclear submarine captain talk about there's the crisis you plan for, and then the crisis you did not plan for, and then you have to change the plan and set goals. And this is great because it applies to damage control, man, overboard drills, that uh, you practice. Uh, the best you can. You come up with what you think are the best procedures for your crew and your boat. And then when the, the caca hits the fan, it may be a little different than you planned for, but you've got a basic plan. You can modify it. You know the principles of what makes it work. If you're prepared for the crises you can identify, you're better prepared for the ones you can't identify or the different twists that can happen. And finally, basically, you don't want to think as like Captain Lawrence. You want to think like Shackleton. And then there's the responsibility. And this is what we talked about earlier with Rick over. So when we say damage control, what are we talking about? These are the basics. Fire, flooding, loss of steering, rig damage, hull damage, mechanicals, electricals. Uh, often people talk about damage control. They forget about the systems on the boat. And in fact, some of them can be pretty critical. How do you deal with them? They could put you out of the race as, as much as uh, losing a mast. It's interesting to look at real races. In the 2015 Sydney Hobart, uh, there were, I think, 32 or something like that withdrawals. And the summary is pretty interesting that nine were due to ripping mainsails, having uh, weak reef points, uh, not reefing when you should, flagging the mainsail instead of reefing it, then it blows itself to death. Uh, so then the last Sydney Hobart uh, in 2021, 30 some odd boats actually almost 50 boats quit. And the same ratio of most of them were mainsail damage, rudder steering damage, but there's others. There's rig, hull, engine, electrical, plus a mix of nine others. So it really hasn't changed. But when you look at what breaks down at sea, this is a pretty good indication of what you should be thinking about. So they, they talk about the rule of the three Ps, preparation, practice, prevention. Preparation before you go to sea, practice before you go to sea, prevention while you're at sea. Uh, I like to do it by checklist. I do it by departments. My rigging, my, my standing rigging, my running rigging, my sails, my mechanicals, et cetera. And then you go through what could go wrong, what do you need to deal with it, and then uh, discuss it with the crew, some of it you can practice. I also like to have a separate heavy weather checklist. You know, heavy weather's coming, you've got uh, Matt's weather forecast going for you, and you want to, Am I prepared for heavy weather? Uh, are the portholes closed? Are the batteries charged up? Is some food prepared? Uh, are all cabinets uh, locked uh, or tied shut? So you're not gonna have things flying around inside the boat. Uh, are your uh, heavy weather sails ready? Are your reef lines rigged? Uh, all the preparation you would do. Uh, is the crew properly rested and properly dressed? Is the safety gear uh, being used like PFDs and tethers? Having a stowage chart is required by most of the major ocean races. I don't know if Chicago Mac requires it. Uh, it should if it doesn't. Where is all your safety equipment located? Where are your through hulls? And then finally, actually assigning crew uh, to different things based on their skills and making sure you have a mix of skills on board. Some of the basics though, in any of these uh, uh, incidents that we'll be talking about, one is you gotta be thinking immediately of, Preventing further damage and is your crew okay? Uh, so there's going to be helmsman responses when certain things happen, crew responses. Uh, you know, certain things happen. You got to make sure all your people are accounted for before you worry about uh, some of the details of doing the fix. Communication is it is it uh, dangerous enough that you need to immediately could do a mayday, uh, which means come get me and help or pan pan where you're basically letting people know that there is a situation aboard and you may later end up in a mayday situation. Uh, you gotta act decisively. 
uh, sitting around doing nothing and not knowing what to do isn't going to deal with the situation. And John Bonds, who started the Safety at Sea uh, seminars years ago at the U.S. Naval Academy, uh, he used the word adapt and prevail, which makes you think of Shackleton. And leadership skills are a part of all this. Here's what uh, my emergency chart looks like, uh, marking uh, different locations, fire extinguishers, through holes, et cetera. A uh, friend of mine said, you know, we're getting older. You ought to have these uh, printed out uh, in larger letters so we can read them. That's interesting if your crew is over 40. So throw this out. Uh, it's easier when we're in person. But what are the only two reasons to abandon ship? Why don't some of you guys kind of yell it out to Matt and uh, throw your ideas on the table? So they got fire, Rich. They got fire. What's the other reason to abandon ship? Sinking is the, the common. Sinking. Here. That's it. Sinking and fire. It's really hard to think of another one. And somebody <laughs> said, yeah, if you can't stand the owner. But uh, we'll, we'll not deal with that one here. <laughs> Flooding and fire. So on Carina for our transatlantic races, we wanted to come up with a, a, a bill, a damage control bill uh, that would apply to both cases of fire and flood because they're very parallel how you deal with them. We were going to have a very complex list of who's assigned to do each thing. And we realized it doesn't really work that way because if you're on watch, you're on deck, you got your PFD, your foul weather gear, you're really suited up to do stuff on deck. The guys below are, are in their, in their uh, underwear, or whatever they're wearing in their bunks. They're better, better suited to what goes on down below in, in, in a situation. So we divided our response for both fire and flood uh, to on watch and off watch, kept it very simple. The on watch, basically you wanna slow the boat down, douse the head sails. Uh, you probably wanna leave the mainsail up for a while just to keep the boat from uh, rocking and rolling too much. And you wanna prepare the rafts and ditch kits. This is the on-deck group. Now, if your rafts are below, somebody's going to have to pass them up to the guys on deck, uh, including spare water, the EPIRB, the VHF, other gear. So the on-watch basically is preparing to abandon ship. Uh, those of you who took the quiz, there was a question about when do you put the life raft in the water? The answer is you don't put the life raft in the water until you intend to use it because it won't just sit there next to the boat at the end of the tether. The tether is going to jerk in the sea state and inflate it. When it gets inflated, it's not going to be happy sitting there very long before it blows away or gets damaged. And then if you decide you're not going to use it, you might as well cut it loose because you're not going to be able to stow it down below. So the life raft is prepared to go over the side. It's attached to a hard point on the boat, but it stays aboard until you have heard abandoned ship. Then you toss it in the water, pull the ripcord by pulling the uh, painter and start getting in. Uh, so the on watch is dealing with all that. The off watch is either fighting the flooding or fighting the fire and sending up gear. Now, it's obvious why you'd be below fighting the flooding because they're there and they can get around the boat a lot easier without wearing all the foul weather gear and all the rest of the stuff. Uh, it may not be so obvious why the off watch is better at fighting the fire. Uh, anybody have an idea? Do you want to be wearing foul weather gear when you fight a fire? No. Why? Because fire weather gear, as we have it, is either some form of plastic or other material, and most of it melts in great heat. Uh, somebody asked me about Gore-Tex. There's a Gore-Tex that's specially treated that uh, firemen and, uh, and particularly uh, uh, the, uh, the skydive firemen who go into forest fires have. But uh, the, fire, the stuff we have on sailboats isn't fireproof. And that if you, and if you have any plastic, that's even worse because it melts against your skin. You're better fighting the fire naked than you are with foul weather gear. Uh, cotton clothing and wool clothing is good. Polyester is not. Uh, you don't have a lot of choices sometimes, but you're being dressed to be on deck does not put you in the right situation to fight a fire and you're not in the right location. So uh, the off watch fights the flooding and fights the fire, sends up gear. Navigator, has to be responsible for getting a pan pan or a May Day off. And that could be down below at the nav station or it could be with a portable VHF. And uh, a lot of VHFs have a, a separate uh, handheld mic in the cockpit. That's great. But you also want some fully charged handheld VHFs because you may lose your VHF down below. 
And uh, uh, I'm a big fan, not of the charging kite. I like the ones with batteries because if you charge your VHF radio and you don't use it for a while, it seems to always be dead when you want to use it. So I, I like uh, maybe a mix of the two is good. We also assign life rafts. And uh, you'll in the interviews with the, the, the people whose boat sunk, which is really cool, you'll find some discussion of life rafts. And when you have a crew of more than 10, I think having a bigger life raft, raft gets to be very difficult because they get to be really unwieldy and heavy. And uh, uh, on Carina, we had two six man for 10 people. And so we had five people assigned to each and they were assigned basis, uh, experience, navigation, medical training, et cetera. So, uh, we had assignments for the two rafts. Okay, fire. I think it's the scariest thing that can happen at sea uh, because you get nowhere to go. Um, interesting when you look at historical parallels, uh, damage control and fire. If you read, read the book Shattered Sword about the Battle of Midway, it's pretty interesting because they go deeply into the Japanese uh, Navy and its protocols. They had very dedicated, trained damage control teams, but they were assigned people. The general crew did not have damage control training. And the, in the, on the four carriers that went down, the damage control teams died pretty quick in the fire, leaving nobody who knew how to fight fires. Uh, the Moskva that was sunk by the Ukrainians last week, uh, we're still wondering why they abandoned ship and didn't fight their own fire and save the ship. Uh, we don't know the details, but... Uh, uh, we suspect that uh, they don't have very good damage control training. Uh, when you're on a, on a boat, you can't afford to have only two people who know what they're doing. The whole crew needs to be trained and be part of the process. And the scariest one is fire at sea. This is where fires come from. Dirty bilges, things happen down there. It could be fuel in the bilge, uh, stoves, electrical batteries, especially lithium ion now you got to worry about, uh, and fuel. And that's why I want shutoffs for your fuel, shutoffs you can reach, uh, and the uh, lightning. So these can all happen. On lithium ion, uh, I'm learning more and more quickly about it, but uh, there's, there's a lot more to be learned. But Stan Honey, who knows more than anything, made his own lithium ion battery bank on his Cal 40. And there, it's on, under a bunk in the main cabin, easy access. He's got computers that monitor each cell, so they shut them down if they get overheated. And then I said, how do you put out a fire? And he says, I have no idea, but I, and he has these huge fireproof gloves. He says, the best shot is pick them up if you can and drop them in the ocean. So uh, there are reports out of different techniques to fight lithium fires, but this is an area which needs uh, a lot more work. So we'll keep this to conventional fires. And uh, prevention, good housekeeping. If you have clean bilges, clean boat, good wires, uh, things stowed away properly, uh, your, your small battery, uh, lithium batteries for your power packs uh, so they're not bouncing around, uh, you can prevent a lot of fires. And that requires inspection to make sure everything is in good shape and clean, fuel lines, uh, particularly propane, heavier than, heavier than air. Uh, you want your propane tanks outside the cabin and no way they can drain propane into the cabin. They have overboard drains. If any of you have a propane tank inside your boat, change it. Uh, electrical gear and proper installations, the lithium batteries, uh, and safe procedures, good maintenance. But you have a fire. There's a couple of rules of thumb. One is the two-minute rule. Uh, this comes from firefighters. Basically, if you can't control fire in two minutes, your chances are slim. That's why if you have a fire on board, you start an immediate abandoned sh ship process, uh, but you don't put the raft in the water until you're told to. Uh, by the skipper, but everything is ready. You don't think, okay, well, let's fight the fire for a while and then decide whether we need to start our abandoned ship procedure. No, you have a fire that's more than a, a minor stovetop that you can put out, depending on what it is with water or, or a blanket. Uh, but any real fire, you start the process, even if you stop it partway through. And that includes communicating with another boat. A fire doubles every minute in size, and this gets compounded. So two, four, 16, et cetera or two, four, eight, not squared, but doubled. Uh, personal injury and death potential. Very few things happen on a boat that really had that personal injury and death potential. And the immediate May Day is appropriate even if you withdraw it. Uh, the four types of fire extinguishers, I'm not gonna go into them, but uh, 
you want to, you know, you can get the ABCs, which are, are you know, very effective. Uh, the Coast Guard for a 40 or 65 foot yacht, uh, these are the requirements, different sizes. Uh, I think it's too small. I think you need more. And so I've gone for the, uh, the four big ones on the boat, one in the forward cabin, in case somebody's trapped there, one in the main cabin, but not too close to the galley. Uh, one somehow that either is in the engine box or I can stick through a hole into the engine box. And then one in the cockpit lazarette, so it's accessible from deck. I think every offshore boat cruising a racing needs four and better have the 10 pound than the five pound, uh, really important. This fire port, when you, if you don't want to put one of the fire boys inside your engine box, and my box gets so warm that they keep going off, so I gave up on that. But fire port costs 15 bucks, and uh, you, you put it in the side of your engine box, you just stick the nozzle through that little plastic uh, X there. Works very well. So what do you do in case of fire? You initialize the abandoned ship. Uh, you, you fight the fire fast, remember the two minute rule. You work in pairs down below. One crew stands by another hand on the shoulder, ready to pull the other crew back if they start to get dizzy. Uh, you go in low to avoid the smoke. Uh, and then to use the fire extinguisher, the first person uh, passes the, is the acronym, pull the pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the trigger and sweep back and forth. And you, you don't stop till the fire extinguisher is empty. Your first shot's the best shot, but it's the base of the fire and sweeping back and forth that's the key. The escape route, never let the fire get between you and the exit. Uh, and that's where you got to have a forward uh, hatch in the forward cabin and, of course, a companionway in the rear. Uh, and on deck, uh, reducing apparent wind should reduce the wind feeding the fire. Uh, uh, I've come around to a conclusion through a friend that being on a broad reach, just drifting slowly is probably about as good as you're going to go. So the smoke that comes up the hatch doesn't blow forward and go down the forward hatch, but go, uh, goes off to the angle, port of starboard of the bow. Uh, and so by going downwind, you're reducing apparent wind. And by going you know, left to right of the downwind, you're, you're getting the smoke away from the boat. If the fire can be put out, great. You assess the damage. You post a reflash watch, which means you watch it. So if it starts again, you can stop it quickly. You can cancel the mayday if you think that the boat is not in danger or keep the mayday going even though the fire's out because maybe you have a lot of serious damage, maybe of injuries. And clean up and do whatever fix you can. Some fires you got abandoned ship even though you've put it out. Eventually, you don't want to abandon it into a raft. You gotta, you'd rather wait for a ship to come alongside. Uh, I don't want to have to memorize or figure out where my, where my phone numbers are for the sat phone. And so I just tape this all up there. Uh, First, you can preload it in your sat phone, but I like to have everything uh, where it's pretty obvious. So even a, even a caveman could send out a distress call. Flooding. Again, causes. Uh, it could be a collision. It could be a plumbing failure, lightning, pump failure, back flooding. Cockpit drains can flood. Hull integrity hit something. Propeller shaft failure rudder post failure, or even a knockdown. All this can lead to flooding. And uh, uh, the prop shaft fail is just one, for example. Every boat is different in how its prop shaft is fitted. And uh, uh, I'll bet that most boats don't have a wrench tight enough to tighten the, uh, uh, the flange at the, at the where the propeller shaft comes into the boat. That reaching, accessing the big nut and actually getting a, a wrench around it uh, most boats don't have anything that will do that. So make sure you have uh, some kind of wrench that can both fit in there and actually grab the, 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 the knurled uh, nut. Uh, flooding rates, just like fires have a cadence, uh, this is how fast water comes in a boat. The bigger the hole and the deeper it is, the faster it floods. And uh, time is your enemy here. Uh, container ships, you hit a container, that's going to do serious damage. For all the containers falling off ships, I actually haven't heard of a sailboat hitting one other than uh, Robert Redford in his movie. Uh, so uh, that, that's, a, that's something that happens. More whales that people seem to be hitting or hitting each other. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of floodings occur because uh, the hose clamps get old or they're not put on in pairs. 
uh, properly, where they, you know, the the uh, screw, screw part of the two should be opposite. One should be to the left, one should be to the right, not in the same location. And then you should make sure both uh, 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 clamps are actually, uh, that the rubber is enough, far enough on the flange that you're actually gripping the rubber and the flange. You're not down on the rubber only. Foredeck hatches are notorious to leak, particularly on lightweight boats like mine, my Express 37. So putting this uh, uh, aluminum uh, uh, bar around three edges, now it's rigid as could be. We've never taken any water since then. Know your boat. Flooding prevention. Basically, you have to test your own boat. Take a hose, go around the decks, uh, make sure you got strong portholes, strong uh, hatches, hatch boards, whatever you need. So you got to know your boat and prepare your boat. Post the through hole diagram. Tie plugs near each through hole. The wooden plugs you buy at West Marine are usually hard. If you ever try to stick one in a through hole and hit it with a sledge, I think it's gonna bounce up and break your jaw. Uh, soft plugs are what you need. Some people make their own out of very soft wood. Uh, I find that the, the true plugs, the rubber ones are really good. And there's small ones you can get too. Uh, Pre-departure inspection, double clamp your hoses, keep your villages clean, test pumps. And uh, if you can get your batteries, uh, uh, not deepest in the in the bilge, and your air intake from the engine uh, least above the floor. You know, putting stuff super low isn't good if you start to flood. Checking the bilge during the, each watch, keeping batteries charged, avoiding collisions, safe navigation. Uh, how do you take your chute down? Are you going to have an open foredeck hatch in heavy weather and stick the bow under a wave and and flood the boat? Uh, and uh, strong hatches. So flooding occurs. Basically, you got to find the leak and stuff it. You're fighting, you're fighting time. So uh, doing a, a permanent fix isn't what you're thinking about. You're just trying to find out how the hell is this water getting in and how do I slow it down? And if you find out uh, what's going on and you can slow it down, then you've got some other actions you can do. You can get onto the tack, which lifts the hole out of the water or the through hole out of the water, for example. So maybe you don't want to take all your sails down. Uh, you got to make sure your crew is not trapped. You want to start the engine and get the batteries charging and the pumps going. Uh, manual pumps are fine, but uh, if you're cruising or double-handed or short-handed, you're not going to be able to man the pumps. You're going to be too busy. You need to have powerful electric pumps. And the little tiny one you put in your deep, narrow bilge on a modern boat uh, isn't going to suffice. So somehow you need to get more electrical pump capacity fitted in your boat. Uh, again, is it serious enough to do a May Day? You can always withdraw it. And uh, initialize your abandoned ship procedures if it's serious. Uh, you can always call them off. Again, don't put the raft in the water until you're ready to use it. So once you've managed to stop uh, the flow of the water, uh, you need to get water out. We just talked about that. Uh, keeping water out, plugs, fathering. Fathering is an old technique where they put a sail underneath the boat, string it from port to starboard, and the Sail uh, covers the hull, the water pressure presses the cloth against the hull. It really works. And it particularly works on big, jagged, smashed areas where you just can't plug it with a, a single plug. It's, you know, you got a damaged area and uh, a crushed couple of square feet. And the best sail to do it with is your storm trisail. It's triangular, it's easy to spread under the boat, storm jib. Bigger the sail, the harder it is. And uh, this works very well if the damage is forward of your keel, because you can wrap the sail around the hull. It's very hard to make it effective when you're trying to do a, you know, the hull starboard of the keel. It's hard to get the sail laid out. So for forward uh, damage to the hull, fathering is very effective. Uh, I like lead sheet for patches because it's soft. If you get it at a plumber store, it's like an eighth of an inch thick, holes drilled around the side of a one foot or 15 inch by 15 inch piece because there's very few surfaces on your hull that are flat. And the lead sheet easily is molded to the shape and you slap from 50 to 200, push it in into the damaged area, shoot a few uh, self-threading uh, uh, screws uh, through the holes that are pre-cut. It actually works quite well. Uh, rubber, wood, all these. Uh, some great epoxies out there, self-tapping screws with the, the driver that fits into your, uh, into your uh, uh, power pack. Uh, the, the good self-tapping screws aren't ones with a slot or an Allen head, uh, uh, Phillips head. They're ones that are hexagonal with a driver that goes over the hex because that really gets bite and 
and uh, you don't spend all your time just stripping the head of your screw. So you put the, the driver, the bag of self-tapping screws, uh, all in a bag together with your uh, uh, power packs, excuse me, with your, uh, uh, with your power pack, and you're ready to go. Shoring, if you have real damage, uh, there's nothing that can replace a six foot two by four and some wooden wedges. And that's the way the Navy does it still, is that you've got to hold a patch or cushion or anything that is against the hole on the side of the boat uh, or a permanent patch. Nothing like putting a, you know, cutting the two by four to length and then hammering opposite wedges into to, to tighten it. Uh, very useful, you can slide it under a bunk, it doesn't get in the way. Uh, big wrench we talked about. The stay afloat from West Marine, I always thought it was just a, a big uh, sales pitch, but we've tested it. That's really cool. It's a, it's like a tub of silly putty. And you just stick your fingers in, you grab it, and you slide it into the cracks, and it works. And we use it at our damage control hands-on sessions. And then uh, we, learned, we ran out of it one year. So we dug the stuff out, we used out of the crack, put it back in the in the uh, can and used it again and again and again. So it's a, it's a, it's not permanent. It's not 5200, but boy, can it fill small cracks. Uh, I love this shot. It's no, I think it's an open 60. Uh, you can see the engine is in a coffer dam. So all the water's in the hull, but actually the engine's dry, which is interesting thinking. This guy's got uh, double uh, electric pumps rigged up to a hose, a cool way to get a lot of water out. And uh, he's got the jacks going over to the batteries, which are high and out of the water. And uh, he looks very calm and looks like he's enjoying it, but uh, uh, very interesting example of uh, how to get the water out. Thomas Riant, the bow broke off his boat and he managed to sail a thousand miles to Australia. That crack went across the deck and down the other side. There's one of the rubber plugs. That's a big one. I'd get a big one, a couple small. Uh, one other comment, uh, one of the big dangers is you break your rudder uh, shaft and, uh, uh, and either if the rudder drops out, you have a big hole in the back of the boat and it's very hard to fill that hole. Uh, you need something big enough to uh, replace your rudder stock. And in a small boat, this regular cone works, but in a bigger boat, it won't. Uh, we'll talk more about it later. Manual pumps, great, except uh, unless you have a really big crew, you're not gonna be able to put the time on them. Uh, I have that electric pump uh, mount on my floorboards and it goes straight out the stern. There's a little S turn, so can't back flood. Uh, any, every time you put a turn in a hose, you're cutting back uh, the capacity. Uh, further, you have to lift it up, you're cutting capacity. So usually a pump is worth only about what half's on the label. But this goes out the stern above the water line with an S turn in it. But putting a flapper on the stern might be a good idea too. You'll hear about that later. Switch to loss of rudder. This gets really complicated. Uh, but a lot of races say you have to have alternate steering, emergency steering. But I've never really seen uh, a, the inspectors do the job they should with it. People say, oh, I'll put my spinnaker pole with a table tied to it, tie it to the back step. That doesn't work. Uh, I'll, I'll, set, I'll, I'll balance sails. That doesn't work in a modern boat. Uh, and there's a lot of examples of people having passed the test but not have a system on board. Uh, we'll later show you one that works real easily. Uh, but you gotta decide when you look at backup steering, is your goal to sail in the air sport or is it continue racing? The solutions can be different. And is it to, is it to satisfy the inspector or you want it to really work? Now the principles you would use are age old. Try to balance the boat, do it with reduced canvas. The, the more sailor you have, the harder it is to, to go straight. The boat gets very, uh, uh, active. Uh, if you can get a, a reef main and a small jib up there and put your storm jib in the middle of four triangles of staysail, balance the big sails, and then use the storm jib to both back to pull the bow off or let it luff and let the bow come up. Uh, that helps. Uh, but the, the real answer is drogues. Uh, and by the way, manpower limited, you've got to take into account how much crew do you have. Uh, if you have only two people on board or three people on board, some techniques aren't gonna work because you don't have the manpower to pull it off like trimming your sails all the time. This does not work. Towing anything from the stern doesn't work. If you try to tow a boat and maneuver 
when you, your tow line is on the stern, it doesn't work. You've got to have the tow line further forward so the boat can pivot. Uh, this is pretty salty looking. Uh, I've never seen this thing really work, uh, but uh, that's one hell of a rig. But I've seen spinnaker poles break when you're trying to do it. And a lot of boats don't carry poles anymore. If they carry them, they're carbon, and they're going to break at the fulcrum every time. This guy had an idea, hang a rudder on the stern, but that rudder is going to break off the first time he pushes the tiller. That's like a dinghy rudder. Uh, Tycho has these giant gudgeons. This was a Whitbread 60 from the early days of the Whitbread race. Uh, uh, strong, but if you've ever tried to put a sunfish or laser rudder on while you're out moving around in the water, it's a bitch. And can you imagine the conditions where a Whitbread 60 loses its steering and you're trying to hang a, a, an eight foot rudder over the stern and actually get it in there? Not likely to happen. Uh, this is a great story, a boat named Breakaway, uh, sailed by uh, high school kids with a really good coach in the vineyard race, Stanford out to Martha's Vineyard and back on Long, you know, around Long Island Sound area. Uh, it broke its rudder and there's only a little tab of rudder left right up at the top. Uh, they quit the race, uh, motored into Block Island to clean things up, and then said, well, let's sail home. They took a two by six and strapped it to their stern. And that acted as a stabilizing fin. So the rudder could handle the boat with little sail area, brief main and a, and a number four jib. They actually sailed home, very creative. On my boat, our goal was we want to continue racing. And the only way to continue racing is having another rudder that works. So we cut a hole in the bottom of the boat, put a trunk in between the cockpit sole and the bottom, and we drop this carbon rudder in. Uh, the part that's not showing inside the trunk is a separate piece from the rudder. The rudder with its shaft pokes through that, that piece that fills up the trunk. And we've uh, sailed the boat for 24 hours uh, this way, uh, but it was expensive and complicated, and it was before we learned another way to do it that's easier. And that's what Mike Keyworth invented which is the, the Gale Rider drogue attached to a 10 foot chain. Then your port and starboard spinnaker sheets click to it. Then they run up to midships. They come to a block in midships and then back to a cockpit, which is port and starboard. And you can tweak the hull of the boat. It's like tweaking your hips. And uh, the boat steers upwind beautifully. It motors beautifully. It reaches beautifully. It'll tack. Uh, the only thing it doesn't want to do is go dead run. The only way you can run is to take your main down and just put up uh, one or two jibs wing and wing. Then it works. Now, this will cost you about a half a knot or a knot of speed, so you're probably not racing anymore. But uh, having Gale Rider Drogue, it's a sea anchor if you need a sea anchor, but it's a great emergency steering, and it works beautifully. Rig damage. Uh, the mask goes over the side. What's the first thing you do? Somebody want to yell it out? Get rid of it. <laughs> well, that's not the first thing. The, first range, thing of is the range of opinion is get rid of it. It seems to be the consensus no. opinion in the room. No, do a crew roll call. What if somebody went over the side and is trapped underneath the boat or underneath the rig? The first thing you do when the mask goes over the side is make sure everybody's still aboard. Then you look at it and you decide, uh, is this, are we in an, Actually, I'll get to that in a second. But the first thing is make sure your crew is all okay. Uh, if you have a, a, a tie-down bolt uh, for the mast, but required in the Bermuda race, I don't know about Chicago Mac, but something strong, welded to your mast step, a bolt that goes through the mast. So when the mast uh, breaks, that the butt of the mast doesn't go leaping out of the step and no plunging through the bottom of your boat uh, or doing further damage. Holds the butt of the mast in. That might prevent the boat from sinking if it keeps the rig from going clear over the side and banging into the side of the boat. To prevent rig damage, it's all again, inspecting before the race, inspecting uh, before the season begins, before the race, uh, making sure that you don't have super floppy lee shrouds where everything gets loose. Uh, daily, if you're out at sea sailing, you don't need to go up the mast in a bosun chair. You can take your binoculars, line your back, and look up at your rig, and you can see every pin and everything with binoculars. Walk around each watch, make sure something hasn't come loose. Uh, bosun chair when the weather permits. Uh, basically, good sailing practices that don't create wear and tear. 
What's harder is replacement. And I have, there's no clear consensus on how often you have to replace standing rigging and turnbuckles. Going up the mast, uh, you know, when you're uh, under sail, helmet, uh, a dinghy PFD so you don't bang and break your ribs. And uh, you clip onto a halyard on the way up, a uh, halyard that's uh, tightened. You can just clip a, uh, onto that as a trolley line to go up. You can have a downhaul. Harnesses on the right are better than bosun chairs, but if you have a good bosun chair like that one, that's a lot more comfortable if you're gonna be up there for a while. So you're sailing along upwind on port tack. You're on the helm. And all of a sudden you look and you see a shroud part where your spreader fold up. What do you do? What's your instantaneous reaction? A couple of people yell out tack. Tack, exactly. Tack immediately. And then you're, you're using the other side of the boat's rigging, which is intact. You're fine as long as you keep the boat heeled over. Now you can do some uh, damage control uh, in terms of supporting the mast. Uh, on the Bermuda race, we came back on my boat, Fest 37. I just replaced all my standing rigging. Uh, I did not replace my custom turnbuckles that came to the boat. Uh, mistake number one. On the way back, uh, it's blowing 40, 45. We're reaching at, at, at sunup with a double reef main. Two guys on deck, I'm below in the nav table and I hear an explosion, the boat starts to rattle. And my watch captain is screaming instantly, the helmsman, tack, tack, tack. And as my head goes through the hatch, I see the mass flying all over the place with the lower shroud turnbuckle having parted. And uh, he tacks so fast that we're on starboard tack now. And uh, the uh, mass is bent two feet in the middle, aluminum mast, uh, but he saved the mast. We eventually jury rigged uh, my strongest line, a guy uh, around the, the, the lower spreader base, around the mast to a block on the rail and uh, uh, to a winch. Uh, and then another one uh, uh, through the chain plate, underneath the turnbuckle through the chain plate and back to another winch. We straighten the mast and sail for New York. But you, I can actually save a rig if you're quick enough. It's crazy to think, but I've seen it done. Okay, you're sailing upwind and the head stay fails. What do you do? Matt? There's a lot of muttering without any strong opinions in the room. Okay. Anyone? anyone? Fall off, fall off. Fall off. You, you run off dead downwind, so you get the pressure of the rig going forward. So you don't have to worry about the head stay. The other is don't drop your jib. Your jib is probably what's holding the, the main mast up. Uh, ease your load in the vang and the back stay so you're not bending the mast backwards. But basically run until you can rig high to the bow. And uh, at that point, you're gonna probably be under very reduced sail uh, for the rest of your trip or motoring. Uh, you're running downwind and your back stay fails. What do you do? Any strong opinions? Trim the main, I heard somewhere out there. Yep, trim the main. Basically, it's a backstay fail. You luff up and drop your head sails. In other words, you get rid of all the pressure pulling the mast forward. And then in order to keep uh, aft pressure on the mast, center line your main. Just trim it as hard as you can with the vang and the sheet, the rock hard, and then get spinnaker of high edge walked around to the stern of the boat. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read all this or see it, but this was attached to the questionnaire, the, the quiz we sent out. And this is a, a damage control matrix that uh, started with my dad a long, long time ago, and we've modified it through the years. But it talks about what's your immediate response to the event, and, and then what's your preliminary repair and your permanent repair. And almost everything falls into three categories. Uh, immediate response, quick way to prevent further damage, really called first aid, and then your permanent repair. And uh, we, we, not, we don't wanna go through a detail here, but this is worth reading line by line and then figure out for your boat, how would you do it? Would you do it differently? What equipment do you need to deal with these situations? This is a one page that's really worth spending a lot of time on and create your own grid if you want to, but I'll bet it's not far different than this. Rich, I'm going to interrupt for a sec. We've got copies of that. I think we have some printed copies in the back. 
it's available for download, but it's definitely worthwhile. And I would be interested to see at least a couple of power boaters out there, but this could easily be adapted for a power boat too. Um, yep. Different problems, but the same, the same thought process. I, th I think most of the discussion we have at these seminars, other than talking about rigging, uh, applies to power boats quite well. Even the man overboard, uh, which we'll get, get into later. Okay, but the mask goes over the side. You've called your crew crew uh, crew roll. They're all okay. And uh, this boat did have a butt. Uh, uh, its mast uh, bolted at the butt because look at that um, uh, remaining stub of the mast. Serves two purposes. It's keeping the broken section from lying alongside and putting a hole in the boat and sinking it uh, because the internal halyards keep the thing together. Internal halyards are wonderful in this kind of situation. The old external halyards, uh, that mass will be in the water. And uh, the other thing it is, it gives you something from which you can make a jury rig later. So very important to have that mass bolted down. But after your crew roll call, uh, if the crew isn't all wearing PFDs, have them put on PFDs uh, because uh, the boat's motion is going to be awful. And if they, if somebody goes over the side, you're not going to be able to do a man overboard pickup. You're not going to be able to motor. you got so much stuff in the water. Uh, and you immediately make a, a judgment. You have sea room. Uh, and uh, a boat down in the Caribbean lost its mass, one of these uh, big super yachts. And uh, they only had one mile of sea room uh, when their mass broke. They, had that, they anchored because they didn't want to be blown ashore. So this immediate situation, roll call, PFD, sea room. Then the question comes with a lot of you guys talk about, do you cut away the rig or save it? Ideally, uh, it'd be nice to save it. Uh, it's it got a lot of money invested in parts of that rig and sales. Uh, if you're out way offshore, you want to do a jury rig. But if it's threatening putting a hole in the side of the boat, you've got to get rid of it. So let's say you decide you got to get rid of it. Uh, how to cut it away. Uh, modern rod rigging is really hard to cut. And these rigging cutters, uh, some don't work at all. Some work, but they only work a couple of times before the blades are shot. Uh, and some people tell me they work great, but uh, my experience is not. Uh, but you, you're carrying a drift pin, which is like a long uh, punch pin that is uh, the tip is small enough you can uh, you can uh, put it on the end of your clevis pin and use a, a sledgehammer to just drive the pin out. Uh, the, you got the rig cutter. Hacksaws can be helpful, but the greatest thing of all is an angle grinder with charged batteries with the right kind of diamond wheel on it with a lot of replacement wheels. And the batteries need to be pre-charged. Uh, they're not waterproof, but uh, you don't care if you damage it. You want to just cut a few pieces of rigging and throw it away when you finish. Uh, the uh, there's a, a trick to releasing rigging. Uh, why would you why would you rig uh, get rid of the loose rigging first? The reason is that if you cut a piece of rigging that's under load, the whole rig will shift. It's under load. You cut it, everything will move suddenly, and it could hurt people. Uh, because you got wires and ropes all over the place and aluminum or carbon. Uh, you get rid of the loose rigging first. It's no risk. It's not under any load. And then you work backwards until you, you, you're on your last loaded. Uh, I added this hydraulics last, last week because this boat that lost its mast down in the Caribbean uh, two weeks ago, uh, they uh, undid their the hydraulic hose too soon and the whole deck was covered with fluid and they were all falling all over the place. And keep the crew clear every time a piece of rigging is uh, cut, particularly under load. Angle grinder is terrific. And uh, it'll cut through uh, a 3 8 inch rod in maybe five seconds. Now, this is what the boat you just saw did as its jury rig. It used the stub of its mast. It used its boom as an outrigger. It rigged a piece of the mast they saved. Uh, to uh, create a top mast. This guy who, who re he, he finished the Vendee Globe. This is my favorite. Uh, Yves Parlier in the one of the early Vendee Globes lost his mast south of Australia. 
he managed to do a, a, a little jury rig and sail into the lagoon in southern New Zealand. He wanted to continue the race. So he got no help from anybody. He, he sailed in there with the jury rig. He dropped anchor. He spent 10 days there. Lots of spectators came to watch it, but nobody was allowed to do anything for him. He basically re-glassed, epoxied his carbon rig, made it a shorter rig, built an A-frame, re-stepped it, uh, got it re-rigged, finished the race 127 days. He wasn't even last. So damage control kit, not going to walk through all this because uh, you can access it uh, online. But basically, you got to think about what do you need to deal with all the situations that were on that matrix that we talked about. And, and you've got to be comfortable. You know how to use all these things. The only way is to try it. Make a mess one day, you know, in your driveway, messing around with 5200 or whatever, or find an old hulk or hunk of fiberglass and start putting patches on it uh, you know, with uh, self-tapping screws. Uh, you, pl you know, learn how to do it uh, so uh, you're comfortable when the time comes. Uh, that's my damage control kit. It, they're all in boxes labeled. Uh, I've got the, uh, the two by four on the left. I've got a splint for my uh, in the days when I had a spinnaker pole on the right and all the pieces. That's the lead. The complete toolbox that fits your damage control needs, but also all your machinery, like your uh, prop shaft. Uh, things you may not think about, but the buckets, the spare parts for all your different systems. Instruction manuals, and please just don't put on a flash drive. We did that for a transatlantic race and then couldn't find the flash drive. We had no paper manuals, so we had to take things apart and figure it out. Uh, a kit for each system on the boat. This is damage control. Uh, sail repair kits for long races. It's incredible how much sticky back you need to use to repair sails that are damaged on an offshore race. So for fun, you, you got to challenge yourself. What do you do if you if you're uh, for drinking water? You know, what if your uh, your tank siphons off into the sink uh, or a tank gets ruptured and all your tanks are connected to each other. You want to have independent tanks, you want to have jugs. The, the benefit of jugs of water, if we do Bermuda with 10 people, we'll have uh, 10 one gallon jugs, all with handles tied in groups so we can throw them in a raft or use them if we lose our water. Refrigeration, what if you lose it? You got to have some food on board that doesn't need it. Uh, preparing for blackout sailing is an interesting one. And uh, what do you need if you lose your power? What if you have a meltdown in your system, a lightning strike? Well, the GPS with batteries, flashlights with lots of batteries, and double handers, it gets even uh, more challenging because you lose your autopilot. And then you get worn out trying to steer. Uh, my backup is, was something invented by this nutcase in California who wrote a book on single-handed sailing. And... Uh, but he came up with this brilliant device, rope with shock cord on each end, snapped to the two rails. And the benefit is uh, you put enough turns on the tiller so it holds the tiller. And so the tiller is held pointing whichever way you want. But you need to do a quick course adjustment is grab the tiller and you push it because the shock cord will stretch. And then it'll snap back to where it was. If you want to set in a little bias on the tiller, you just grab the rope and you rotate a little bit so the tiller creeps left or right. And uh, uh, we've used that on races where we lost our autopilot. You can't go to sleep and let it steer straight for a long time, but it'll let you do things and it, it rests you. You can also, by the way, rig that on a steering wheel if you do it on a spoke, but you don't get as much throw as you do on a tiller. So you want to practice useful drills. Uh, in damage control, you'll be using, uh, in the fall, we'll be using fire extinguishers to put out real fires. Uh, flooding will be looking at pumps. Uh, we've talked about abandoned ship, but you want to do drills with your crew, uh, just walk through drills. If you have an old life raft, pick a day where it's not too rough and actually get off into a life raft with somebody on board. Uh, communication drills, uh, going aloft in the bosun chair, how to do maintenance on your boat, steering with your emergency tiller and drogue, actually try it. Most emergency tillers break within five minutes of putting them on. They're not uh, sturdy enough. Crew education. Uh, we're going to have a break, but these were survivors who we had tell their story at a 
another session we did, a fire uh, where uh, they they had it partly under control, but the, the owner thought he was losing it. And yet half the crew get into the life raft. It was very calm. And half stay aboard to fight the fire. When they gave up, they all got in the raft. Uh, the catamaran there started to break up in one hull. It, it, it down flooded until the water went across to the other hull. They got in their raft and they had a hell of a time getting up on a ship that came by. That's a good story. Uh, the Swan 44 dismasted and they had to make the decision to cut it loose. But you can see that uh, the, the butt of the mass is still fastened to the mast step, which can um, save the hull. You know, these are the two which uh, I'll, I'll have you, you know, listen to the videos of these guys, the great stories of two boats that sunk. Uh, so at this point, uh, are, they, are there any questions you want to throw out? It's a little hard in this medium, I know. Uh, the other is I'm curious if anybody online or in the room was actually on a boat that had a serious fire or sunk. If anybody did, it would be great to give them a mic for a minute or two, Matt. Anyone? Anyone here? No, that's a good, no. good thing, by the way. That is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Funny, I, I, I suggest that in Texas. And we had one guy, his boat sunk, one caught fire, two people had man overboards. Oh, good so Lord. We had a hell of a come to Jesus uh, session there, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Matt, I think we should take a break and when we yep. come back, uh, we do some of these videos. It is 1128. We'll start up again at 1140 if that works. So, 10 minute break. Sound good? Yep. Thanks.
I'm on a break here. One hour. You did? Okay, thanks. I need to go live in the bunkers. <laughs> okay, needs total not sense of reality. How are things in your view? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said. <laughs> well, we know we're supposed to go to we just came Scotland. Back. Then we're going to Scotland. I said, it's a pretty good life. I said, you're a lot better than every, most people in this world. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, she's this and she's that. I said, you better start eating your leaves. I'm like, come on. The guy's hopes, pessimistic. Negative outlook on life. There's no idea. Oh, she has, she has COVID. Was oh, that right? No. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I said you may not be going to Scotland. Well, you know, 
she has no patience with other people who are sick. You know, she's a perfectionist. But so this is good. It gives her a taste. Like that. Uh, Whatever you say. Uh, Guys. <laughs> Does it get told? Maybe. Chair, like a chair, so often you're scraping off the wall. Yeah. 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 All right, Rich, you ready to get rolling here? Yep. Let all right, get... folks, if you can grab your seats. Rich, are you going to talk about the leadership forum at all? Because if not, I will. <laughs> no, go ahead. You okay. go ahead. Okay, guys, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and, uh, and try to get rolling here if everyone can grab their seats. Um, while we're doing that, I want to mention um, something that Storm Triso Club did. It was, what, in November, I think, of 2020 during the pandemic. Yes. supposed to be live and we pivoted pretty well to Zoom. Um, but if you're interested in the topics Rich talked about in that first session in particular about leadership, um, not just leadership in boating, although it was clearly focused on, on sailing, um, but just leadership in general, the, the Storm Trestle Club had a fantastic one day leadership symposium. Um, and the results of that kicked out into a, a, a printed publication, but there's actually a page on the Storm Trestle website also that has a lot of video, but it had an amazing group of speakers, both from the boating world, um, you know, Gary Jobson, Stan Honey, Richard Mullen, Robert Notch Johnson, but also um, leaders from other aspects of, of, of life. Um, a number of um, people from the military, um, a number of people, not, not, not the Navy, we had a Marine Special, or yeah, Marine Special Forces, Force Recon um, soldier. It was, it was a really great, great day. A lot of good content. Um, I put the link in the chat and we can get it to you other ways too. But if, if you're interested in leadership, either on a boat or in business or in regular life, it's a, it's a good rabbit hole to go down. So, um, all right, with that, Rich, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. We got everyone back in their seats here. Okay. One of the other interesting uh, speakers we had was uh, a uh, Mount Everest uh, uh, guide, the preeminent guide who uh, led 20 some odd expeditions to the top, including the one that discovered the body of George Mallory. And he was one of our guys. So it was really awesome, the, the, the diversity we had there. Okay. Uh, can, can you see this uh, gentleman's face here? Is that? Uh, yep, we're good. You might want to maximize the window if yeah. you can. Yeah, that's uh, John Sangmeister from the West Coast, America's Cup sailor from the 80s. And uh, acted in some movies and had a, 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 a Santa Cruz 70 uh, in the Transpac race uh, a few years ago. Uh, you might have uh, read about it. Uh, it sunk. Uh, but John tells a good story here. This is the uh, channel. It's a pleasure being here. I'm hoping that I can share some of the lessons we learned in our mishap uh, in July of 2019. Um, we had a beautiful boat and after the worst start in the history of, uh, uh, of ocean racing, our uh, OEX was doing a nice job uh, getting us through the fleet. 
Prior to the start of the race, uh, I had the good fortune of sailing with this crew uh, and, and as many as uh, six trans packs together. We've been sailing together as a team now for over 16 years, off and on. There was only one fellow that I'd, I'd never done the trans pack with, but he was um, very experienced. Um, but I had a, had a brief meeting with the, with the crew before the start, and I said, you know, my, my only real job is to ensure that all of you get home safely to your families. Everything else is gravy. And, uh, and I also like to steal uh, another line from uh, uh, a famous TransPAC home from They said the other purpose of TransPAC is that at the end of the race, that you're all better friends than you were when you started the race. And uh, I think we, we achieved both of those goals. Um, OEX is a Santa Cruz 70 designed by Bill Lee. It was uh, a really successful boat. Uh, won the barn door twice. We set several records with the boat. It had been in our family for nearly 15 years. And uh, I bought it from my father-in-law about 10 years ago and uh, been having an awful lot of fun with it. Um, we were well prepared for any calamity. Um, we had our Sweet Lake life rafts on the back of the boat. And uh, if I can offer one thing, I would encourage you always to be over rafted because if you've never stepped into a raft in earnest, I can tell you that there are small confining places. And if you have to be there for a while, um, more is better. Uh, we elected to take an extra probably 150 pounds with uh, two six man rafts. We were only a crew of nine. We probably could have uh, gone to a single raft or a small valise to go with it, but we decided to go with two. Uh, prior to this presentation, uh, David asked, where were you in the race or when this happened? And the important thing to remember is that we were 15 miles ahead of our competitors. And, uh, uh, and I say that with great respect. I've, uh, I've sailed with Roy and uh, his father and I started with them in 1987 on the first pie wacket. And uh, Roy Sr. wrote my letters of recommendation to business school. And I've uh, been forever intertwined in the Disney pie wacket crew and their friends, their competitors, their worthy adversaries. And, uh, uh, and in this case, they were our rescuers. So um, we were sailing along. And of course, these things only happen at night, in the dead of night. It was about uh, 1.50 in the morning. Um, we were doing anywhere from 13 to 17 knots since we were starting to surf. We had uh, a small jib and a reef in the main, and the boat was performing just beautifully. We had made a series of modifications to the boat, none around the rudder, um, but uh, we were really happy with our performance. Um, and as I was trimming the main sheet, a uh, few feet from the rudder post, I heard the larger, loudest bang I've ever heard on a sailboat and um, our helmsman said that he'd uh, lost steering we feared that we were going to go into a jive uh, we eased everything and uh, prepared to douse the head sole. and as i was running forward to uh, uh, take the jib down i looked down and, and water was rushing in and i knew we were going to sink um, billy tranquil tells the story about stars and stripes sinking in, in long beach harbor in 2003, and that happened in less than two minutes. And uh, I was on board uh, Betsby uh, in 1995 with my wife as a guest when one Australia sank, and uh, that happened in less than 90 seconds. We had uh, put a large watertight bulkhead in the bow because the last eight transpacks I've done, we've, uh, we've managed to hit everything from telephone poles at 30 knots to nets and other debris. So the ocean is littered with, with uh, trash and other detritus. And if, if you haven't made uh, at least that bow bulkhead, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, three weeks prior to this race, I asked a, a dear friend and, and yacht designer, should I put a bulkhead in front of uh, the rudder post? And he sort of said, you know, you're probably going to hit the keel first. So it's okay. You'll be all right. And we're still friends. and. Um, and uh, I, if, you, if you have an older boat or if you have a big wide open race boat, uh, at least a dam that goes up above the waterline uh, would be helpful. Because as things happen, it, it, it happens very quickly. Um, 
immediately the crew, the off watch came alive. Our navigator, Brendan Bush was on the radio. Um, and I can't speak to his uh, calm demeanor uh, more. He was brilliant on the radio. And, uh, and the Coast Guard boomed back from uh, St. Nicholas Island, which is uh, uh, about 100 miles behind us. And uh, they weren't in the area, but the uh, Teddy Roosevelt was. They were doing maneuvers off of San Clemente. And uh, they detoured a, a sea king that was in the air, skippered by the uh, son of an of a OAH crew member. And he heard OEX, and uh, he, apparently he firewalled the, the helicopter to our location. Um, as the water was coming in, I, I uh, directed uh, two of our crew to get the rafts out and launched because um, I didn't know how much time we were going to have. Ryan Bramar and Eric Burzins worked in the back of the boat trying to get the rudder out. And if you can imagine this whirling dervish of a, of a five inch square rudder stock spinning around with every wave and destroying everything around it. Um, Bruce Cooper, the head of Omen Sales here in uh, Long Beach or here in uh, Newport Beach tells the story of a similar incident on Condor in a, in a Cabo race and the force of the rudder post pinning his arm against uh, a bulkhead broke his arm. So it was a pretty violent scene down below. Water was coming in quickly and uh, we knew that we, we, were, we were not winning the war. The wrath deployed after uh, a couple of uh, anxious moments. Uh, we kept them close astern to the back of the boat, and uh, and I we took some uh, sail ties and we tied the two rafts together. They have a, a series of webbing around the edge, and we tied those two together and made preparations to deploy. The EPIRBs went off. We had three EPIRBs on board, two for the boat and a personal one. Uh, everyone knew where we were. Um, surprisingly. Um, uh, the uh, the one thing that really got our families notified was uh, if you've ever had a yellow brick, if you haven't looked at the device closely, because it's always wrapped up in that in the uh, the holding uh, device that you velcro to your stanchion, there's a red SOS button on that, and that's a great button. And if you haven't tried that button out. And you want to wake up a race committee, hit that button because all of their tracking internationally goes off immediately. So Yellow Brick in England calls Tom Trujillo in, in Oahu, who starts calling family members. It's a wonderful thing. And if you haven't used it, I hope you don't ever have to use it, but be aware that, that it's there. That we were losing the battle. And when we finally, Eric and, and uh, and Ryan managed to get the quadrant off the boat, uh, off the rudder post. And with each wave, as the boat would lift up, they would push with their legs and try to get the one inch of the rudder post out. When they finally got the rudder out, we tried the bung, we tried the plug, we tried a bucket. And the wellhead pressure, I mean, that slide that Rich posted of 300 gallon, or 1,300 gallons an hour, or whatever it was, Ryan is a big fellow, and he sat on that thing and got shot off like he was sitting in a, a, a top of a geyser. It was just overwhelming. Um, as a suggestion for all offshore sail, uh, sailors, one thing that happened that compounded the problem is the rudder post went through. It managed to destroy our bilge pump lines and our exhaust lines. So. Now we actually had four holes in the back of the boat. And uh, as that was happening, we, you know, we stuffed something in one hole and a tennis ball would fly out. Or um, as a solution to that, that I would recommend would be flapper valves externally on the transom. Uh, I don't know if it would have helped in this situation. I don't know if anything would have, uh, other than a water tech bulkhead forward of the rudder post. Pilac, it was uh, about 15 miles behind us at the time of the break. And thankfully, their layout, they have uh, two VHF radios, uh, one in the galley and one at the nav station. And 
Roy and Ben Mitchell, Roy Disney and Ben Mitchell were getting ready to go on watch. And um, they overheard the radio traffic and they turned it up. And, and thankfully, uh, you know, we, we were rescued by one of the best crews in the world and they diverted. Um, as we were getting ready to go, you know, I, I still had that, that one vision of one Australia sinking and I kept worrying that with the large watertight bulkhead in, in the bow, that somehow the boat would sink bow up and the rig would crash down on the life rafts and further compound the problem with injury. And if you have a mishap at sea, you are far ahead of the game if you don't have any injuries. I've been in, in accidents, filming wind, a, a fellow, we crushed two guys between the 12 meter and a rib. And I was in the water with a guy who ultimately lost his leg because of the, the impact. If you can avoid injuries, I would encourage you to do that. This is not the time for heroics if there are alternate strategies to get your crew safely off the boat. And um, so when I saw the, the running lights of Piwak and I said, boys, it's time to go. And if, you know, looking down below, Ryan and Eric were there. It was, it was akin to every submarine movie you've ever seen. Like, close the hatch or we're all going to sink. It's like, Ryan and Eric, we got to go. Or the boat, you know, you're going down with this. And um, we were sitting in the rafts. And, and, you know, we're going to look back in a little bit of humor now because tragedy and comedy are very closely tied to one another. And uh, I was looking at it, our beloved... OEX sinking and um, and I, I I let out a loud expletive and the boys thought uh, he said that the boat's sinking and I said no my Rolex was in the was in the uh, charge table now this wasn't any Rolex this is a Rolex that uh, Roland Pouton flew down 28 watches in 1987 and presented it to the crew when we won the America's Cup so it was it had some sentimental value. And as I was being dragged aboard Pilac in a less than uh, elegant fashion, Brendan Bush, our navigator, stuck out his arm and said, looking for this? And if you can imagine the presence of mind as he's up to his chest in water, he decided to look inside the truck table and, um, and see if there were any valuables in there that he should grab before he left the boat. And I'm grateful to that. Um, we got home, we'll go through a couple of months. There's a nice photo of Roy and I. And, that, and Roy and I have known each other a long time and I am grateful for his friendship. And, uh, and this is on the trip home. We were welcome on board Pilac and uh, they shared fellowship, they shared tuna, we shared you know, cocktail hours. Uh, we watched the boat sink and then we turned around and sailed home. It was a long trip home and uh, they gave us dry clothes. Uh, you know, they got out of their bunks and said, here, you know, um, get some sleep. I called uh, Tom Trujillo on the, on the sat phone and he says, you know, we think the boat's still floating. I said, mm, I don't think so. I said, well, we can still see you on the tracker. And I went back to my crew and I was talking with them and they say, they think the boat's still floating because they can see the tracker. And Ryan Bramar looks at me and goes, I have the tracker. I'm like, why do you have the tracker? He goes, well, you've already lost so much money. I wanted you to get your $150 deposit back for the tracker. <laughs> we got back. Uh, this is an early photo. This is my first uh, trip with Pilac way back when. You can see uh, Roy Edward and Roy Pat in the center. Uh, Roy Pat's got the broom. We're all younger and we all had more hair back then. Um, when we got home, I uh, nominated uh, Roy and his crew for the Arthur B. Hansen Rescue Medal, and uh, the uh, Board of U.S. Sailing uh, unanimously affirmed that nomination, and I had the privilege of presenting that at the uh, Transback Award ceremony to the entire crew. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a well-earned. And uh, you know, the, the sad part was not only did OEX get out of the race, but uh, the Pilot team had to uh, sacrifice their race as well on our behalf, and I'm forever grateful to that. Uh, this is a photo of us back in Marina del Rey. We arrived 26 hours later. 
and uh, you can see Paul and Gary and uh, and the OEX crew, and uh, there's Roy in the center. And, uh, you know, it was nice to be with friends on the way home. Um, my wife, my beautiful bride, picked us up at three in the morning and we drove back to our house. We were still in our foul weather gear. It was all the clothing we had and uh, the crew's in our kitchen. And uh, many of you know that years ago I had a midlife crisis and I bought an offshore racing trimer and that is still in our family. And uh, she looked at all of us and she said, in all seriousness, you sank the wrong fucking boat. Um, <laughs> I'm grateful that we're here. I'm hoping that we'll be able to do the race again this summer. Um, uh, here are some, uh, some takeaways and I'll leave this slide up for everyone. Uh, there are a few things that we did learn. Again, make certain that, you're, that you avoid injuries. Um, if you have the opportunity to do the, uh, the practical course, we had all done that. And that level of familiarity with getting into a raft in earnest and, and lighting uh, flares in earnest, that was really helpful. So thanks for letting me be part of this. John, thank you very much. You, you tell it, uh, former Commodore of the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club, a Canadian by birth, he lives in Bermuda, where he'll be speaking to us, from where he'll be speaking to us uh, today. Uh, his disaster was on his uh, FAR 56 called Monterey in 2017, and it occurred in a race that uh, Wes had organized uh, from Antigua to Bermuda, and the disaster took place uh, 250 uh, nautical miles south of Bermuda. So Les, uh, over to you. Good morning. This is Monterey, our FAR pilot host, 56, finishing the ARC in 2016. Our trouble happened as we were sailing the inaugural Antigua Bermuda race a year later. We had a crew of six, including Carmen or Bob Metal, who was with here with us today. It was a beautiful night, and we were reaching along at eight knots. At the start of the 4 a.m. watch, we discovered we were taking on water. Calling all crew up, I closed the seacocks on the through holes as we all tried to identify the source of the water. We had a laminated chart of the boats plumbing with the seacocks highlighted. We knew that Esprit de Corps was five miles behind us. We tried to reach them on VHF to notify them of our situation, but got no response. At the same time, we contacted RCC Bermuda on the sat phone to alert them. At this point, we were merely looking for EDC to come and stand by as we attempted to solve our problem. Meanwhile, two crew had been trying to use a large manual pump without success. The boat was filling surprisingly fast, much more than would be explained by a broken or detached hose. I told Kit to add Mayday to his VHF collar and had John send up a parachute flare. The parachute flare did the job. John called out that he could see EDC's lights shift towards us. Shortly thereafter, they came up on the VHF. While pitch dark, the weather conditions were benign with the 12 knot breeze, but there was a swell that would prevent EDC from coming alongside. We would need the life raft to transfer to EDC. The boys launched the raft. Of course, it inflated upside down. As the crew drew the tether in, Bob and I were able to get on the sugar scoop and muscle the raft upright in the lee of the boat. Knowing we were now safe, I went below again to reassess the situation. The boat was now bowed down with three feet of water in the forward cabin. With the volume of water in the boat, I was totally, it, it was totally impossible to determine the source. I could not see anything that could be done and was concerned that the boat might become unstable as it filled further. The boat was replaceable, while getting someone trapped or hurt was another matter. I decided to abandon ship and get everyone in the raft. The raft being held tightly to the stern made this quite simple. It was now 5 a.m., just 45 minutes after realizing the leak was more than just a flooded head. EDC was approaching at this point. We cut loose and drifted away from Monterey. Monterey posted a scheduled position on Yellow Brick at 7.30 a.m., but not at 8.30. Presumably that bracketed her sinking. In about an hour, we had gone from tranquility, a beautiful evening sail, to the deck of our rescuer. So what caused the problem? <clears throat> we might have hit something. However, if we didn't feel a lurch, as you'd expect to be, hit something heavy like a uh, container. 
there might have been structural failure. When the boat was in uh, uh, Croatia one winter, the rig had been over tightened, and perhaps that uh, put stress on the hull and caused, uh, which would, could have led to failure. <clears throat> the bow thruster housing might have failed. This was suggested by the developer of the boat, um, and had it been the case, that would explain the volume of water that we were seeing. Lessons learned. We had spent a great deal of time aboard the boat through the summer and fall of 2016. Three of the six aboard were part of the ARC crew. Perhaps our familiarity had created some overconfidence. While I'm not sure we would have been able to change the eventual outcome, in hindsight, there are things we could have done better. In advance of an onshore voyage, in addition to a man overboard drill, we should have conducted a flooding drill. Organization and practice would have optimized our time. So what's involved? The first item, most importantly, is to assign responsibilities. We had six crew. My uh, plan would have been to have two people on each of these three subjects. By having two people on each subject, you get a person second guessing each other uh, and that uh, ensures that something's not overlooked. The first responsibility is flood investigation, the second pumps, the third communication. Flood investigation, what's involved here? Once the boat has significant water, it's very difficult to identify the source. So the first question is, did something unusual happen? In doing the drill, you want to open and close each seacock to ensure that you understand the location. If the seacock functions correctly, uh, you will want to identify other possible sources of flooding. In our case, the stern gland, the bow thruster, the rudder gator, transducers. Uh, and you want to prioritize things. You want to have an order of action. In our case, when we close all the seacocks, then check the stern gland and other possible sources. And it's important that you don't stop looking until the water is going down and that, that this group doesn't get distracted from their role. This is the chart of uh, the various uh, hull, through hulls and um, other uh, things under the water um, that uh, we needed to investigate. On the left, you see the chart that we had on the boat. On the right is the chart that I wish we'd had on the boat. Um, the large print on this chart allows us to uh, read it without needing glasses. The crew involved in the pumps uh, need to know the location and the switching of all the pumps and all of their overboard outlets. Um, they uh, want to be familiar with uh, the, the use of a portable trash pump, which I'll speak to in a couple of minutes. Um, they want to fill the villages with fresh water at the dock and test each pump, observing how uh, they outflow. They should ask, can the floor, floor peak be sealed off? In the case of Monterey, uh, we had a workroom forward, and it would have been quite uh, simple to, uh, uh, to create a forward uh, bulkhead uh, by closing the door and just sealing a couple of uh, leak, a couple of uh, ports underneath the, the, the door. I spoke about a portable trash pump. This is uh, something that uh, we set up for a trip um, a transatlantic in uh, 2019. Um, you can see it has the largest pump that we could find uh, and um, a two inch trash hose. And the total cost of this was all 300 bucks. Subsequently, uh, and in talking with other people, I realized that we could, rather than use this uh, DC pump, use an AC pump, such as you see here. Um, this pump has a, a full horsepower, uh, which is a lot more than that uh, AC, uh, DC pump had, um, and incredibly inexpensive. Uh, this whole kit that you see in front of you here is $70. We spoke about testing pumps. When we were in uh, the Azores, we tested, uh, 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 we did a, a flood test or a flooding drill, uh, and there was a huge um, uh, pump on, on the boat. Beautiful looking thing. Uh, absolutely no water coming through it. We took it apart, and this is what we found. You can see the salt crusted in the center. The pump was totally useless. We were able to clean it, fix it, and, um, and uh, uh, make it worthwhile and make it working. 
The third group uh, is the communications group. Uh, this group should uh, know how to access the current location, identify nearby boats on AIS. They should be familiar with the VHF system. Um, they should train with both the ship's VHF and the handheld. Uh, they should know how the SAT phone works. Uh, they should ensure that SAT phones all the emergency numbers program that they uh, might need. And lo should log a test call with authorities. Uh, RCC Bermuda is happy to hear from boats on their way to Bermuda. Uh, they, the scoop would also be responsible for the EPIRM, players, life raft, grab bags. So what's some of the, to summarize some of the equipment I suggest everybody should have, you should have a high water alarm, large print list of hull openings, strong torches, uh, and uh, a portable trash pump. Another item is parachute flares. Parachute flares have been dropped off the uh, required solar list about a couple of years ago in favor of uh, electronic means of, of, uh, of attraction. Uh, it's a mistake. Um, we didn't get a response um, from any of the uh, boats that were nearby until we set off a parachute flare. It was about 22 miles behind us that saw the parachute flare. It's just a different mode of uh, communication and uh, it's important. A couple of other observations while we're at it. Um, I thought the connection between the tether and the life raft was a bit questionable. Um, there's only 12 knots of breeze. Uh, in 30 knots of breeze, the, uh, the pressure on the life raft would be huge. While I'm not aware of stories of the, of the tethers breaking, um, and I realize that the tether is uh, designed to have a, uh, uh, so that the boat can't uh, tow the life raft down, uh, there's a knife on the, on the uh, tether and um, designed particularly to cut the tether. Uh, and I think I'd like to write, rely on that other than the, the junction that I could see. Um, another thing is when you're launching a life raft, you, before doing so, you want to ensure that the tether is led through a uh, fair lead and onto a winch that the crew have with gloves on. Because even at 12 knots of breeze, there's a lot of load on, the, on this uh, tether. Uh, in 30 knots of breeze, it would be hell. And you, you want to be sure that you can get that life raft right against the boat so that people can get into the life raft without having to get in the water. This idea that you clip onto the tether and swim across the life raft, not a good idea. So that's the sum of my comments. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. Thank you, Les. The rescue boat right behind uh, Monterey, Les's, Les's boat, uh, had a French film crew on it. So this is a four minute, uh, video uh and i uh, i hope that you can um uh, you can see it hey rich we lost your screen oh, anyone else you need to to ready to bed and shit are you ready or waiting Now it's back. I'm trying to stop this. I'm having trouble. <laughs> Anyone here speak French and translate that for us? <laughs> okay, they're, they're free. Okay, we're going to you. Nice and smooth. Wait a minute that you're getting away from your boat for safety. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Am I back on? Yep. Okay. Uh, those two interviews uh, I, I found pretty amazing. We have a bunch of others, but not enough time now. But you saw two very competent owners, very well organized, handle uh, you know dangerous situations very well. Uh, the only suggestion in hindsight that I would offer, and I'm not sure it would have worked, but what we talked about fathering, we drape a trisol or storm jib over the side and pull it tight might have actually worked in these two cases uh, or might not have, but covering a hole like a, uh, a bow thruster with two big holes port and starboard or a hole left by a rudder once the rudder had been pushed out and floated away. It's possible that wrapping the sail around the hull could have blocked the water, uh, but uh, uh, it's something that you rarely ever hear about uh, it, I think I suspect it would have been too late in the case of OEX. In the case of Monterey, I don't think at the time they were thinking that it could have been a bow thruster. So, uh, uh, but they handled both situations and nobody hurt, which is uh, the end goal. Uh, at this point, uh, I, I'd like to go to our last uh, PowerPoint, which would be a, a man overboard. And there's a, it's such a big topic, but I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. And I'd like to do it now rather than in the fall, because now is the time where you guys can spend the, you have a sailing season coming, you can try some things out. And then next fall, uh, when we have our hands-on seminar, we're actually gonna go out on boats and do this. So we have dummies, and then uh, depending on conditions and the availability of trained swimmers, we uh, might do it with uh, people in the water too. Alongside the dock, we'll definitely do it with people in the water. So uh, let me bring up the, uh, Man overboard video. Okay. Uh, this is something Storm Trice Club's worked on for years. Uh, all our seminars are hands on. So we actually learn by having seminars with man overboard drills being done. We also go out and practice these things. And uh, in real life, we know there are. Most crews don't actually practice, or if they do, it's a one-shot thing, maybe once every few years. Very few offshore crews and big boat crews actually do regular man overboard drills. And it's sad, you know, you practice tax, you practice jibe, sets and douses, but um, somehow it just doesn't, people don't get around to it. Uh, we'd like to certainly convince people to do it. It's, it's actually fun to do. And God forbid you lose somebody, you don't want to think about the fact you could have prepared. Uh, again, leadership. Somebody is responsible, the owner, to make sure this gets done. And train the way you fight, fight the way you train. That's why you want to practice it. So you learn how to do it the best way in practice. So you're likely to do it well when it really happens. And then the crisis you plan for, the one you didn't. At least if you know the fundamentals and a good method for your crew and your boat, then uh, if things change, you can adjust to it. And stop, think, act, the more you practice, the quicker this stop, think, act uh, cycle is. Quickly, how not to be a man overboard. Crotch straps. Uh, if you're gonna be in the water, you want crotch straps in your PFD. A combination of inflatable that's maintained. And it's really important that every year, everybody uh, orally inflate their uh, uh, inflatable, leave it overnight, make sure it works. Inspect the CO2 cylinder and the hydrostatic release. Uh, repack it carefully and, uh, and know that there's three ways to inflate it. Uh, one is the automatic, the other is the manual pull cord. There are different locations for different styles of uh, PFD. And the final is the tube. And to access the oral tube, you've got to open up the outer cover of your PFD. You know where the, uh, you don't want to have be unzipping it, but there's a place with false teeth where you can just pull it open and the thing will pop open. You can access the oral tube. Tube. If you go in the water with foul weather gear, you'll have enough flotation for a little while to 
at least lay on your back and blow some air into the tube. Jack lines, how you rig them, where you put them is all important. You don't want to drag in the water. And so moving them as far inboard as your deck layout allows, twisting them so it's easy to snap onto uh, rather than having them flat on deck. You don't want them rope or wire because your foot will roll on them. And you want to stop them uh, before the bow and before the stern, uh, less chance of going over the side and into the water if they're center line and aft a little bit there or forward there. If a uh, crew went in the water there, they'd be actually dragging right next to the transom. It would not be a stern. And uh, if you're a, a double hander or, or a cruiser or a single hander, your only chance to get out uh, uh, quickly might be at the end of the tether to grab something hanging over the stern. Uh, straddling the jack line uh, allows you with one hand to be very stable going fore and aft and keep the other hand free. Jack lines on the cabin top are the best thing because if you go on the short three foot tether, you can't go over the side. You can't go over the lifelines. And they're particularly important if you have to go to leeward, which you don't want to do. But if you have to go down there to mess with a sheet lead or something, you want to be on a cabin top uh, tether, a, a jack line with a short tether. So you can't go over the leeward side. Uh, a lot of MOBs occur, people going up and down hatches. And you need to have a, a point, uh, a, a strop where you can go down with it, tether on and unhitch when you get to the captain's sole, leave it hanging, and then clip back on before you go up. And if you have an off watch of five people, there should be five tethers hanging there. And each person as they go and watch those grabs one and clips on as they go up. Uh, this is what happened in the clipper race years ago. You notice, you'll note that the uh, a guy unclips before he goes down the companionway. The moment an ocean race became a matter of life or death. Watcher sailor Arthur Bowers comes off watch and does his safety line to go below deck. The crew has practiced this to use been drilled into them, but this is no test. A life ring is thrown, it doesn't reach him. They try again with a crew member in the seat in a harness. Arthur is grabbed. The South Atlantic is cold, the waves eight meters high, the wind gusting. It took 17 minutes to get Arthur back on deck, cold, wet, shot. The key here is that uh, he had a survival suit on, he had a PF floating PFD, he was able to survive in time for the boat to actually come and get them. And if you have somebody in the water who's either injured, unconscious, hypothermic, uh, or been in the water a long time, they're probably not gonna be able to do very much to help themselves, like get into a life sling. And the, the, the fallback way of getting somebody out of the water in an offshore boat with a full crew is to lower somebody in a bosun chair uh, who has a PFD on, a, uh, a rescue style, which is a fat dinghy type, is easier to move around and then inflatable, and a helmet, and lower them over uh, with, a, with a short tether to clip onto the MOB and you hoist them both back up. This is becoming a fundamental practice that we now recommend to people. I mentioned before, if you're at the end of your tether dragging in the water, uh, I double hand a lot. I have this so I could reach over, hopefully, and grab that strop and pull myself toward the back of the boat. Uh, it's, it's not what you wanna do, but it's, it's something you might have to do. Uh, uh, for full crew, uh, I, there's a different method, method of getting somebody up when they're dragging on tether, and that is to clip a higher to their, to their tether line, just hoist the higher and lift them right up. Pulling them on board is very difficult to do. Of course, the helmsman should stop the boat so you're not dragging them. Uh, men going to the back of the boat to take a leak creates lots of man overboards. We had one in the Sydney Hobart. Luckily, he was tethered to the boat. We found him under the stern, gasping for air. He didn't use this because he thought it was uh, not manly. Uh, this is very good for heavy weather and a night. And if you're off watch and you want to come on deck, got to have PFD tether and uh, boat shoots. Easier to use the head. Uh, this is not a problem women have. That's why you have very few women overboard. There's lots of other safe practices I won't go into, but some are very obvious, like having good non-skid paint on your boat. Uh, this will be available later. 
but there's a lot of setting up of your boat that will prevent uh, having somebody go overboard. Uh, it's always interesting that nobody ever talks about what the MOB should be doing. If you're out there, you know, make sure your PFD is inflated. Tighten your crotch straps. Turn on your AIS. Get the antenna up there. Make sure your strobe is on. Whistle regularly. Whistle really goes a long distance. A lot of MOBs are recovered because of their whistle. Uh, don't face into the waves and get mouthfuls of water. Put your back of your head to the wave and put your spray hood up. Uh, stay warm. Don't swim. Uh, and wave to the boat when it's in sight in a calm way that they know you're okay, and then they can use a life sling. If they see you inert and not moving, they may decide we better come alongside and lower somebody in the water. Uh, better you can get in a life sling, it's a little safer. So in, in terms of thinking about man overboard, you have to plan and practice for the heavy weather one. Anything easier than heavy weather, is it is fine. It's it's easier to do, but you got to be prepared for man overboard in dirty weather. Uh, you don't want to get any further away from the MOB than than you have to be because you want to save both time getting back and you want to keep them in sight. Hence the quick stop. Quick stops aren't very easy if you're under spinnaker shorthanded sailing though, or heavy weather in the spinnaker where you can't turn the bow in the wind. So that's where AIS comes in. Uh, the ability to uh, both have AIS and the MOB to track them and then also hit the MOB button so you know where you lost them. Uh, your goal should be to recover the MOB on the first attempt. And you want to get them as soon as you can, but you don't want to rush it and kill the MOB because the boat is the biggest risk to the MOB. If you can find the MOB, then that's the first big risk of not being able to find them. Once you find them, the big risk is the boat hurts them. And so you got to do it right the first time, and you got to do it safely. Uh, Recovering under sail, we practice it all the time. Uh, it's great to learn how to handle your boat if your engine doesn't work, but it's not the way to recover an MOB. Uh, even after tons of practice, luffing your boat up and stopping right next to the MOB without getting caught in irons, without running them over, is hard. And you, this is not the time to take three or four shots at it. This is the time to have an engine on and your sails down and be under the best control you can be. And the engine is the way. So if your engine is, is functioning, that is the way you should get your MOB back. Uh, using the engine, uh, this video basically shows how they, they're motoring up. They, get ready to hit they miss them the first time, but they stay near them and go in reverse. I'm not taking you through the whole thing but it basically shows how you can maneuver your boat next to them and not have to go around again. Uh, these are kind of the basics. You know, the first thing is the obvious demand overboard, flotation, assign a pointer, uh, the MOB button, head to wind to stop the boat. If you have a spinnaker, you got to figure out how you and your crew and boat best stop the boat or go the least distance. That takes uh, practice. Uh, lines out of the water before you start the engine. And then uh, get rid of your sails. And then check your lines again before you go in gear. Got to know your equipment. We've talked about that before. Knowing it and trying it out and having enough crew that know how to do it is important. Uh, know your boat. Uh, the Umedi situation, Chicago Mac, uh, uh, it took three approaches. The second one, the bow swung over and the man went under the boat. Uh, this is what happens when you try to come alongside in difficult conditions, particularly with modern boats. So there's got to be a better alternative where you save the coming alongside as the final method when the MOB can't use the life sling. And to make it worse, modern boats handle poorly at low speed, even under power. we we'll show some reasons. Chines, boats that have chines are especially dangerous. The MOB next to the boat can slide under the boat and the boat slams down on it. Uh, traditional designs are better, but you still better keep the MOB away from the boat until you're ready to get them up and out of the water. Uh, some boats go in irons when they quick stop, particularly modern boats. So if you're trying to sail out of it, you're going to be sitting there in irons. Lying a hull is interesting because if you're a short hand, a cruiser or a double hander, uh, you're not going to be able to be on the helm all the time. You're going to have to basically leave the helm to get your sails down and leave your helm later to winch in the MOB. And so you've got to know how your boat sits with nobody at the helm. Uh, 
This is a picture of a Medi, which is the same as so many modern boats, a short cord keel, handles lousily uh, under engine and at slow speeds, sail or power. Uh, here are twin rudder boats, very popular now, uh, but the propellers in the middle and the rudders in the side, there's no prop wash. So when you slow down into three knots, it's hopeless to steer these boats. Uh, it's not a, a mystery why this twin engine plane has twin rudders, a rudder behind each propeller so they can function. Uh, on my boat, I double hand, and so uh, I have this little tether sitting there on the stern deck that in a two or three seconds, I can clip it onto the eye bolt and restrict my rudder. And that's because if I have a double hand, I'm in overboard means there's somebody alone in my boat. Uh, dropping the mainsail, uh, I suggest that a boat decides which side you're going to pick up your man overboard, whether you're full crew or double hand. If you're going to be a starboard side pickup, meaning your life sling is rigged on the starboard quarter of your boat, or port side, that means your life sling is rigged on the port quarter, because the life sling isn't happy coming along the opposite side of the boat. Uh, so you got to figure out, does your boat turn better right or left? Most boats are neutral. But if you have a favorite side, make sure that's the side you plan on picking your MOB up. So you automatically, on my boat, starboard side pickup, I drop my jib on the port side and trim the sail in hard. Uh, make sure both sheets are tight so they're not in the water, and then uh, drop the mainsail on the port side and lock it down with a tight main sheet and uh, uh, and traveler. I put one line through the left of the sail just to keep it quiet. Uh, every boat's different, uh, but any boat with mainsail slides, you shouldn't be going offshore with a bolt rope. You should have slides. A yeah, bolt rope means you can't take a sail down safely uh, in offshore racing. So you practice on your boat. How do you best get your sails down? Where do you want to put them? Uh, now, this is a video, and it shows uh, we tested how my Express 37 behaved in uh, a seaway with 20 to 30 knots of wind, the easterly Long Island sounds like a northerly probably coming down Lake Michigan, and, uh, uh, and with clipping in the tiller, how's the boat going to sit? What's it going to do? And until you test it, you have no idea. Color restricted by the one lanyard and the snapshot. It's down to the one pilot. We're also backing down on the run. Uh, during that time, uh, we took a photo of our B and G, and it's interesting. We're angled 100 degrees to the true wind angle, so the wind's just a hair behind the beam. Uh, we we're in a lull then, but it was blowing from 18 up to the high 20s at that point for two days of easterly. And uh, there we go. And uh, we're going forward at only half a knot. The sails are down. The boat's pointing at uh, 100 degree true wind angle. And with a tiller restricted, we go about half a knot, barely creeping forward. And the arrow shows the drift between current and leeway. Uh, we're going sideways at 1.1 knots, which is a great setup to pick up a man overboard, slowly drifting down on a man overboard to lure it, for example. And we sat that way for 20 minutes and nothing changed. The boat didn't change five degrees on course. I, I suspect every modern boat that sails down and rudder locked in the middle is going to be on a beam reach. If you have a split rig with two masts, who knows? But on modern sloops, I think this is the way all boats will sit. But you got to test it on your own boat if you're going to be shorthanded cruising or racing and see and, and not have a helmsman at all times. So first life sling recovery techniques. Uh, this is great for full crew and shorthanded, but only works when the MOB is mobile and can actually slide into the ring. And it's all about keeping a safe distance while you're getting ready to bring them on board. Uh, that's your typical life sling recovery, circling around and stopping. Uh, but when you're under sail, even if you're off head to wind, the boat doesn't stop for a while, and you can easily rip the life sling out of the hands of the MOB. Again, why using your engine? Uh, this is a maneuver that the guy's engine is up, he's doing under, excuse me, sails up, he's doing under sail, but he's doing a good turn. He did a, a tight cut underneath and uh, 
the tighter you make your turn, the quicker the rope gets to the MOB. In this case, it's a tall boy buoy. And then they slide back and get, and get into the ring. Here's a the video of that. If you do too wide and gentle a turn, you'll circle the MOB forever. Uh, it's like picking up a, a water skier, but that tight turn. Now, if there's a real seaway running, it might be another boat length away from the MOB. And go, immediately go head to wind. Now, if you have the engine right now, you want to stop the boat dead right there. And slowly the MOB will get pulled, you know, it will work its way down the line to the life length. But here, the boat keeps going because there's no engine. Now, this is a way you normally use a life sling. Uh, you, you, you pull them in by hand, and then you have a preset loop about 10 feet, 15 feet up from the sling. Well, and you can just tie that and leave it there. And then you uh, attach a higher to it. No need to do a bow, and you can just use the higher. You only lift it 10 feet. And uh, hoist them up midships using a spinnaker higher. But you can see why an unconscious MOB isn't going to be able to stay in there. An alternative is uh, you can pull alongside to windward and throw the life sling. That keeps the MOB away from the boat uh, 10 or 15 feet. You can't throw this upwind and breeze. So you got to position yourself to windward the MOB. Again, this is a full crew maneuver while you have somebody in the helm, the engine crew. Uh, and this works uh, well. See, it, uh, you know, MOB gets in it. But uh, it's not going to work for a shorthanded cruising situation where you don't have a lot of people to keep the boat in one position and uh, throw the lifeline. So we came up with a better idea. This came from uh, originally Comanche and the big ocean trimarans, where they steer awfully under, under sail. Even under power, they don't steer, uh, steer well. And they're dangerous to the MOB in the water. Uh, they send out rescue swimmers at the end of a long line who then attach themselves to the MOB, then a hired hoist them up. Uh, we're not recommending rescue swimmers because that requires professional training. Uh, we do recommend the, the rescue crew in a bosun chair for uh, certain maneuvers, but not somebody free swimming. Here, uh, instead of an MOB, we have a, a, two, a, a dummy, which is a Dacron bag with 200 pounds of water in it. And the dummy is at the end of the life sling rope and they've just uh, stopped the boat uh, under engine, and they're about to rotate the boat 90 degrees, clip a higher to the yellow line and hoist, leaving it anchored at the stern. So you're lifting it up in kind of an A formation. Uh, we'll show you it to you in real life here. The drone is moving, the boat is not. So I've got the MOB at the end. Uh, somebody worked a higher to the stern. No need to pull it in. They pulled it in a little to clip the higher on it. Now they're hoisting the higher up. Again, they're turning the boat 90 degrees. So the MOB comes in midships, not under the stern. Uh, you don't need a lot of horsepower to do this. They overdo it. When you see the MOB skipping across the water, you can imagine the ride the MOB would be having. I mean, you got the MOB now. If he's in the life sling, there's no reason to jerk him out of it. But these guys are practicing. And uh, it's a heck of a ride for the MOB. But you notice two men at the uh, pumping and one guy on a winch. All you need is the uh, one guy slowly falling into mass or one guy just winching. With a small winch, it's a workout on the winch, but uh, you can do it. Again, perpendicular to the MOB. And uh, there's the, you can see the line, you can see the, the life sling line anchored on the stern and then up to the higher, then down to the MOB. Uh, in this case, they're rigged for port side because their life slings on their port quarter. Uh, this shows that one person on a regular winch, this is on a Figaro 32-footer, uh, uh, can hoist up a 200-pound uh, man. Uh, if you're a cruising couple and, and the guy weighs 220 and the woman's 120, uh, this is not going to be that easy. But if you're a cruising boat, you should have an electric winch, at least one, or an electric winch handle. So I'm talking, that gives you the geometry of it because if the life sling rope is too long, you're going to two block the higher at the top of the mast. So by testing, pulling in and out and, and, and actually having somebody sit in a life sling on deck, you want to get the buttocks over the lifeline and that's all. Now, if you use the yellow rope that comes with life slings, 
It stretches about 10 feet. It also kinks easily on the halyard. Uh, it's also not that strong. And if it's sun bleached, it's not strong at all. Uh, we recommend going to a spectra which floats. And uh, you get red spectra, you can get yellow spectra, and then you adjust it to this length. And if you do a tight turn, like we showed in the uh, drone shot, if you do a tight turn, uh, it's long enough to work. That's what it looks like from the MOB. And then using your crew on your boat and figuring out what works for your boat, you need to come up with a plan. And that's for your boat. Now, your, yours could be different than mine. This is double-handed on an Express 37. I'll bet there's a lot of similarities. Uh, this will be available, but the key is you got to make one up for your own boat and practice it. These are some of the tips. Uh, Robin Ox Johnson helped us develop all this stuff. Uh, PFDs, by the way, have a loop in it. He, he created his own, but now they all come with us. But you, the life swing is a safer way because you don't have to come alongside. The Gale Rider drove, that's, you, know, you got to be quite the uh, agile person to get in that. Uh, you got better ways of the life sling. A ladder, good luck trying to get up a ladder if you're a man overboard with foul weather gear full of water. Uh, maybe one mounted on the stern that's rigid would work, but you, you really don't want to be at the stern if you can avoid it. It's a dangerous place for being in the water. For a double hander who's got an unconscious MOB in the water, meaning you're alone on deck, the only way I figured out how to get the body out of the water is one of those mooring hooks on a pole and you hook it on a, the, the shoulder strap of the PFD. It's not what you want to end up with. So the real suggestion is don't go to the side. Going to the rescue crew, if they're unconscious, uh, going over this, being lowered over on a halyard in a harness, then clipping on either a second halyard or clipping on a tether. In the case on the right, uh, it's a mountain climbing tether. It's a, uh, a mountaineer lanyard where you can attach it and then pull it so they're two block with each other because you prefer the MOB to be belly to belly where you can wrap your legs around them and arms around them and come up together. So the key here is how to practice and make your own plan. And uh, uh, I found that assigning a crew to take notes and video really helps. Use a tall boy as an MOB. You can put an AIS on the tall boy and, and Rick Hayes in Chicago has done a lot of this in the evening sales. And a lot of you guys may have done it. It's a great idea, uh, really works. Uh, test your MOB in the cockpit. Uh, some take have to be held five seconds. Uh, test the quick stop behavior of a boat in different conditions. If it's blown uh, 10 knots and you're under spinnaker, you're gonna luff up into the wind and, and do kind of a stretch and blow on the foredeck, maybe. If it's blown 30 knots, you gonna do it? I don't think so. Your boat may have a threshold of 15 knots, 20 knots, the problem you don't want to encounter is luff up and then blow the tack out of the spinnaker and have it flying behind the boat. So we like to do letter boxes when we're offshore, even in moderate winds. Uh, and test your boat's motoring characteristic, practice in easy conditions, then harder. If you're going to go on an offshore race like a Transpac or a Transatlantic, I think you want to do some nighttime practices. Uh, alongside recoveries, practice out at the dock or on the mooring, and then do things uh, uh, out in the open. Great examples of people who, knowing these skills, have saved a lot of people. And I won't go into this, but about 20 lives saved in that little page there. So leave you with that. You got to train the way you fight, fight the way you train. And then you got to do it with your boat, your partner if you're double handed or cruising, or your crew. And you got to make your own plan. And this is not a technique we recommend. <laughs> so. I think you've seen enough uh, PowerPoint today, guys. Uh, but uh, real, really happy to take any questions or you know, share any experiences people have. Uh, uh, again, it's hard in this medium to see faces and to, to have the kind of dialogue that would be you know, nicer to have. Anyone got any questions? We're happy to pass the mic around or any comments. No, it's been a long day, so I, uh, oh, yeah. I understand that. So, right. so uh, Matt, what I'll do is I'll send the Q&A, the answers to the quizzes, uh, and you can post them for everybody or distribute them for everybody to look at. Uh, just score yourselves honestly. There's no, there's, there's no downside, uh, but I'd love to, you know, get the names of people, get a first, second, or third, and only one, two, or three wrong. 
out of the 42. And uh, you should get most of them right now that you've heard today's stuff and you have uh, uh, the damage control matrix. But I think it's fun taking it and checking the answers. Rich, thank you very much. Uh, this, this has been uh, unbelievably helpful and a great lead in to the hands-on safety at sea that we're going to host uh, the first weekend of October. Uh, Rich is going to be the moderator for that uh, and it will be more intensive. Uh, this is being recorded, we'll distribute a link to it. Uh, and if there's someone not here that wants to take the hands-on safety at sea, uh, we're gonna ask that they watch this video first to get the background, also to get the certification, the US Sailing Hands-On uh, certification, you have, to, you have to watch the now 15 part video series that uh, US Sailing has uh, uh, for the hands-on. Uh, Rich and Matt did a terrific job. Let's give them a, let's give them a nice round of applause. And, and and most importantly, uh, the bar is open. Uh, we're, we're serving food. I think uh, if I can find Taylor, she'll have a drink ticket for everybody, not you, Scouts. Uh, <laughs> uh, but even if you're not a member, food is for purchase. Uh, and we thank you all for coming. Hey, Ray, can I have a dark and stormy? Yeah. You betcha. We'll save your ticket. <laughs> we'll save your ticket till October, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll distribute a link. Yes. Yeah, and we'll probably put it up on the uh, Mac Race website. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. Rich, thank you. Thanks, thank Rich. You guys. Enjoyed it. Look I, forward I, to owe you a, I owe you a dark and stormy. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to being there in person. And it'll be a lot of fun doing the hands-on stuff. Yeah, Absolutely. great. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Talk to you soon, Rich. Thank you.